Good evening and welcome to the October 21st Weathersfield Town Council meeting. If Councillor Breton would please lead us in the pledge. Thank you. Would the town clerk please take attendance? Councillor Breton? Here. Councillor Forrest? Here. Councillor Hurley is unable to attend. Councillor Latina may be late. Councillor Lesser? Here. Councillor Rell? Here. Councillor Spinella? Here. Deputy Mayor Martino? Here. And Mayor Morimbello? Here. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so we have a lot on our last agenda as this council. Um, first, we're going to start by a presentation uh, proclamation from the library board. If I could have Brooke Berry, the library director, come up, and Doreen uh, Ciarcia, and other members of the library board, if you'd like to come up, please, and make the presentation. Thank you. terrified to touch this computer. <laughs> I'm trying hard. <laughs> uh, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, members of the Town Council and the Town Manager, I'd like to thank you uh, all for the opportunity to permit the library to take just a couple minutes to make a brief presentation. We don't get quite the same turnout <laughs> as you do. <laughs> Not that we're really complaining. About a decade ago, members of the Weathersfield Library Board helped to start a new program at the library. This program is, called time, is still called Time to Talk, which is the library's English conversation class for adults. And it takes place on Tuesday nights for nine months of the year. The participants of Time to Talk, could you stand? are comprised of local area residents. Over the years, participants have come from all over the world, France, Bosnia, Portugal, Colombia, China, India, Italy, Mexico, Thailand, Burma, Albania, Venezuela, Peru, Germany, Afghanistan, Japan, Honduras, Poland, Ukraine, Haiti, Cuba, and Bangladesh. There's probably some missing World Cup teams. <laughs> it's amazing. One of the goals of Time to Talk is for participants to develop conversation and speaking skills. One of the other goals is for the participants to develop skills in a welcoming and friendly environment. These are, excuse me, these are, uh, there are several individuals who have helped this initiative over the years and include Carol Schulman, Susan Grady, and Janine Barassi. And Janine's right over there. However, tonight, the library board would like to officially recognize one individual who has made a significant contribution to this and could be said the driving force behind it all. And it's Weatherfield's own Kim Bobbitt. does succeed in creating a welcoming and friendly and emotional <laughs> environment and it is positive and it is contagious. I have been here for five years and it is always a delight to see her working in her different roles around town. She wears many, many hats. Sometimes there are moments when I get exhausted just watching her <laughs> and think where on earth does she have all of this energy? And sometimes I'm like, oh, Kim. <laughs> So tonight, the library board would like to present this award to her for, out, for, to her for outstanding contributions and service to the Weathersfield Library. And just to say a big thank you to her for all of her great work. The community is truly blessed to have you. Thank you. 
your students are going to look at this. Can, can I come, come up? up? Yes, they can come up maybe in the middle of it. All right, you guys got to come up. <laughs> it's always great to get a surprise in on you, Kim. <laughs> you know too much of what's going on in town. <laughs> Congratulations. Do I still have to talk about the annual meeting, or can I? No. <laughs> but, but Kim, we would like to thank you for all you do for the town of Wethersfield, whether it's in your official role as a WEC coordinator or if it's in your volunteer capacities, which are many. So thank you for all you do, Kim. Next, we have a proclamation for Keen Lights On After School Program. Carolyn, are you coming up? And Judy? So whereas the citizens of the Wethersfield community stand firmly committed to quality after-school programs and opportunities because they provide safe, challenging, and engaging learning experiences that help children develop social, emotional, physical, and academic skills. They support working families by ensuring their children are safe and productive after their regular school day ends. They build stronger communities by involving students parents, business leaders, and adult volunteers in the lives of young people, thereby promoting positive relationships among youth, families, and adults. And they engage families, schools, and community partners in advancing the welfare of our children. Whereas, Keenan Kids After School Enrichment Program has provided significant leadership in the area of community involvement, in the education and well-being of our youth, grounded in the principle that quality after-school programs are key to helping our children become successful adults. And whereas Lights On After School, the national celebration of after-school programs held this year on October 22nd, 2019, promotes the importance of quality after-school programs in the lives of children, families, and communities. And whereas more than 28 million children in the United States have parents who work outside the home, and 19.4 million have no place to go after school. Many after-school programs across the country are facing funding shortfalls so severe that they are being forced to close their doors and turn off their lights. Whereas the town of Wethersfield is committed to investing in the health and safety of all young people by providing expanded learning opportunities that will help close the achievement gap and prepare young people to compete in the global economy. Now, therefore, on behalf of the town council, I, Amy Morin Bello, mayor of the town of Wethersfield, do hereby proclaim October 22nd, 2019, as lights on after school day, and call upon our community to engage in innovative after school programs and activities that ensure the lights stay on and the doors stay open for all the children after school. Thank you. Yes, we'd like you both to. I 
would just like to thank Carolyn. She is the inspiration for the after-school programs and does an unbelievable job. And I'd like to thank everybody in the community for coming to the carnival. We did better than any year in the past. Fantastic. And mm -hmm. that all that money goes to the after-school programs. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, well, I'd like to invite you all to our big celebration tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow night, 6.30 to 8.30 at the community center where we will um, celebrate after school time. We will be sh showing off our um, activities after school and just um, celebrating our youth and all the great possibilities we provide after school. Um, so we'd love to see you all there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have one other proclamation. Is Amy Camilleri here? Okay, I will read the proclamation. Um, whereas Phelan McDermott syndrome is a rare genetic disorder caused by a mutation of the Shank 3 gene or a missing piece of genetic material that causes a wide range of symptoms of varying degree, delayed or absent speech, symptoms of autism spectrum disorder, low muscle tone, motor delays, and epilepsy, depending on the genetic change that occurs. There is currently no cure, medication, or treatment. Whereas many are diagnosed, be, are undiagnosed because genetic testing is the only way to make a diagnosis. It's essential that one to two, it's, excuse me, it's estimated that one to two percent of children diagnosed with autism are found to have this genetic, have, have this. After genetic testing and ongoing scientific research collaboration and clinical trials are imperative to discovering new information that could lead to finding more and better ways to care for those with this disorder and someday a cure. Whereas those living with Phelan McDermott syndrome face many challenges and the way we respond has the capacity to enhance their quality of life. Compassion, support, and inclusion are invaluable. Making eye contact can let them know you see them for the beautiful children they are. It can help keep a family strong and make a community stronger. Whereas this year, Joey Camilleri, 13-year-old brother to Ava, who is one of the under 2,300 people in the world with this condition, asked to be part of the 365 Days of Phelan Lucky campaign, in which he, along with six other families, wear their Phelan Lucky gear every day for a year and post it to social media to help raise funds and awareness. Now, therefore, on behalf of the town council, I, Amy Morin-Bello, mayor of the town of Wethersfield, do hereby deem October 22nd, 2019, to be Phelan McDermott Syndrome Awareness Day and to increase awareness and acceptance of those living with this rare disorder. So we will make sure that this gets to the family as well as a citation uh, that we've received from the state. Okay, next we have the Colonel Chester Fife and Drum. Um, welcome. Is it on? Okay, yes. good evening. Uh, most of you probably know who I am, Art Hutchinson. I live on Maple Street, but I am the director of the Colonel John Chester Fife and Drum Corps and have been for many years as a past member also. Um, what we are, uh, my presentation tonight is um, I want to let the uh, town council and community know that next year is our 80th anniversary. Uh, that's a a long time for an organization, a youth organization, to be uh, in existence. So with that, uh, we are planning, with the help of the, the town uh, crew, uh, employees, um, we are planning a, a parade and muster on the weekend of July 11th next year. Now, hopefully, uh, you, you town council people got the packet um, I, 
Well, maybe I'll we'll pass it out to you later, but it explains everything what we propose to do. And I can't give it to you in five minutes. So uh, I'll give you a short synopsis. Um, we plan on uh, having a parade. Uh, a muster is a gathering of ancient fife and drum corps. Uh, we expect to be uh, inviting 60 or 70, but we're hoping to get around 40 corps. Um, and we plan on holding it at Cove Park. We plan on uh, inviting the whole town to come join us. It's uh, a great experience. Um, a lot of different uh, age groups from seven to 90 participate in Fife and Drum Corps, believe it or not. Um, so we, we've already got the blessing of the uh, Parks Board. Uh, we did sit down with the town manager and um, gone over our itinerary and um, Kathy Bagley is really helping us out a lot. She's great, I'll tell you. I've worked with her for years, so um, she, she's a great person and uh, she's an asset to the town, let me tell you. So um, we did have a muster, I don't know <coughs> anybody here remembers 50, uh, 25 years ago, our 50th anniversary. So uh, we're just gonna celebrate another another anniversary of uh, 80 years. So I don't know if anybody has any questions, but um, that's basically uh, everything. Thank you, it sounds like an exciting event for the town of Wethersfield, and we're, um, we're happy to have that take place in our town. Great. Um, and I'm sure we'll have conversations as it moves forward. Yes, we will. With I'm the sure. details. <laughs> yes. yeah. yeah. Are there any council questions? And I may have missed it, sir. Did you mention the date? July 11th. Well, it's actually July 10th, 11th, and 12th. By time you, because um, on a Friday night, we usually have what they call a tattoo, which we invite uh, a limited number of uh, drum corps to uh, you know, participate and play a uh, concert. And, uh, and then the main event will be Saturday. Thank you. OK. Go ahead. Thanks, Art. OK. Uh, kind of a question. Would they be coming from just Connecticut or? No, we, uh, we anticipate uh, a little history. That's the week before Deep River, uh, the big muster down in Deep River. Well, they get cores from all over the world, uh, especially Switzerland. So we're hoping to bring uh, a, f a couple of them in and plus, out west, there's uh, Plymouth Fife and Drum, um, there's Tippa Canoe. Um, so we, we will be having cores from basically all of the United States. Williamsburg, you know, these are all cores that we will invite. And hopefully, knock on wood, we might get the old guard Fife and Drum too. From now do they stay locally in hotels? Yes, they will stay locally. The other thing is we would like to provide camping for some of the out of town cores, which uh, when you get the packet, we, we got the, it all mapped out where everything is gonna be and everything. Great, okay. Okay. Look forward to it. Yes, now we do many, too. Now how many do you anticipate having in town? Uh, participants, uh, we're thinking about uh, 150 to 200. But we're hoping the town comes out and supports us. So, you know, we hope to get a couple thousand, you know. <laughs> Great. Yes. Okay, thanks so much, okay. Art. Appreciate Thank you. it. Yep. Okay, our next presentation is going to be a little longer. <coughs> We've got the MDC here. Scott, come on up and introduce yourself and your fellow uh, commissioner, your commissioners yes. and fellow staff. Well, thank you very much for the invite. Uh, we appreciate uh, here at the council meeting to talk about the budget and talk about integrated planning and why the integrated planning is so important uh, for our towns uh, uh, with our tax on towns for the sewer system in Avalorum. Uh, I'd just like to recognize Commissioner Gatto, Adel, and Camilleri who are here. Also, our Chairman Bill DeBella is here with us tonight. So we have been, every time we do a presentation, 
uh, we're a bunch of engineers or financial people and everybody says, what did you just talk about? So we hear that and we, uh, this year we have developed um, some videos. Uh, they're almost like cartoons. They're one minute long and they try to touch base on specific issues that are very complicated to explain. We have them here tonight. We also have a little uh, video of our, our uh, South Conveyance Tunnel that we're building on the South Meadows to West Hartford. So we'd like to show those videos first and uh, then I'll go into the presentation on the budget and uh, the integrated plan, if that's okay. Okay. Okay, great. Let's put my glasses oh, on. Oh, just wipe off. Okay, we don't have the video on the tunnel, but that's okay. We'll Is the front one on? Is it if on? If the we'll front screen's on, we'll okay. come out. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's great. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You got it? Yeah, it's coming. Yep. Might want to, can you lift the lights a little bit? Yeah. Let's get out. Let's get out. Just like the air we breathe, we need water to live. Providing drinking water has a cost. So what exactly are you paying for in your water bill? Every day, the MDC reliably provides nearly 50 million gallons of pure, safe drinking water to approximately 400,000 people. Your drinking water comes from the Barkhamstead and Nepalk reservoirs, which hold 40 billion gallons of water. Over 31,000 acres of MDC watershed land safeguards the reservoirs through source protection and forest management programs. Additionally, the MDC annually conducts over 100,000 tests on your drinking water, treats it before delivering it to your home, and works to maintain 1,500 miles of pipe in the distribution system. The MDC also operates popular recreation areas on portions of its watershed land. From maintaining our watershed to ensuring the highest quality water standards, a significant amount of work goes into bringing you this precious resource. Learn more. While safe, quality drinking water is a necessity, so is the removal and treatment of wastewater. The MDC's ratepayers fund these services through portions of their property taxes and water bills. Millions of gallons of wastewater flow from homes and businesses through over 1,200 miles of sewer pipe maintained by MDC to our state-of-the-art treatment facilities where over 20 billion gallons of wastewater is treated annually. Through the Clean Water Project, required by the federal and state government, the MDC is making improvements to the sewer system to minimize overflows and backups during heavy rains. When completed, the project will benefit the health of our customers, local waterways, the Connecticut River, and ultimately, Long Island Sound. Providing reliable, pure drinking water is a portion of MDC's service to our customers. Improving and maintaining sewer infrastructure and treating wastewater are equally valuable services for our customers and the environment. Learn more. I already pay an MDC water bill, so why does part of my property taxes go to the MDC? In addition to providing quality, safe drinking water, the MDC provides sewer and wastewater services to its member towns. The cost of those sewer services is billed to the eight MDC towns through a tax called ad valorem. To determine your town share of ad valorem, the MDC takes a three-year average of the property taxes collected by each town. It then divides the total amount of ad valorem proportionally among the towns based on those averages. Your town passes along ad valorem by dividing it among all property owners and adding it into your property taxes. Ad valorem pays for the MDC's wastewater and sewer services. The wastewater system includes sewers, which collect wastewater from homes, businesses, and industry. Sewer pipes and pump stations that transport wastewater to MDC treatment facilities. Treatment plants, which clean wastewater to be safely discharged into waterways like the Connecticut River. 
Funds collected through Ad Valorem pay for the inspection, repair, rehabilitation and cleaning of sewer lines, along with the operations, maintenance and improvements at the wastewater treatment plants. These activities, and the Ad Valorem that funds them, are crucial for a properly functioning wastewater system, which protects the health and safety of everyone in the Greater Hartford region and benefits the environment. Learn more. So those videos are our attempt to try and take difficult topics and simplify them for the public. Um, we, we, have to, uh, we have shared these uh, on our um, town meetings with the town managers. We'd like to utilize these types of educational tools in our town halls, uh, in locations that our customers are typically gather, our customer service building. Um, so our, our Oh, I'm sorry. Our goals are, are really to um, utilize this, this exercise. It's a relatively inexpensive way to educate the public. They're about $6,000 per video, and we're going to be using that to, um, to um, uh, develop uh, uh, one-minute videos on uh, why is your water bill going up, why is your sewer bill going up, and things that are important to the towns, important to our commissioners, important to the public. So we'll be, you'll be seeing more and more of these, but we would like to develop uh, kiosks in our town so that we can share them with the public. So we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, the budget and, uh, uh, and also integrated planning. Um, just, just in terms of starting um, the budgetary process, we are on a calendar year. Uh, our towns are on a fiscal year. We start planning in early September for uh, uh, budget, uh, budget discussions with staff. And uh, we have already had um, uh, three town manager meetings, uh, as you can see, uh, the 10th, the 26th, and the 10th of uh, October. And we have an, had a number of, uh, of finance workshop meetings with our commissioners. Uh, we just had one today. The, the goal of that is in early September, it's very, uh, crude. We're, we're just meeting with our, with our departments. We have about 15 <coughs> departments. We're trying to understand, um, as you can imagine, we haven't even gone through the winter months to understand what overtime has been expended because of water main breaks. So there's a lot of things we're not aware of. Uh, we d haven't even finished the, the calendar year to understand what c water consumption is. So we're guesstimating and projecting what that would be. Typically, after October, we pretty much can guarantee that what the projection rates are going to be. Um, but the important part is, uh, and I know this, this has gotten through to the councils, that in our first meeting we had shown uh, the, uh, the town managers that we were looking at a roughly a 15% increase in Avalorum. Approximately two weeks later, we were able to fine tune um, uh, budgets within those 15 departments. It goes up from a manager level to a director level, and then even uh, to my level. So we had brought that 15% increase um, down to um, 11%. And uh, what I'll show you in a, in a few slides is, uh, with even more uh, a review of the budget, we've brought that down to 6.9% increase, not the 15 that you had heard. So we're going to talk about the uh, deep approval of the long-term control plan, which is directly related to the integrated planning. We're going to talk about uh, obviously the proactive uh, maintenance of infrastructure, OPEB trust, which is a big discussion, not only at the NBC, but at our town council meetings. Uh, we're trying to do more with less. We had uh, 700 employees in 2006. We now have, uh, we will have 481 this year uh, in 2020. And um, we are looking at uh, deploying a, um, programs uh, for our employees. 64% uh, of our medical spend in pharmaceuticals was for really two categories, hypertension and, and diabetes. So $3 million of our medical spend on pharmaceuticals was for 101 employees out of roughly 500. 
So we're looking to attack that and try and to get our employees healthier through a wellness program. Um, and um, we're also going to be talking about, uh, uh, you know, this, this comes up every year uh, since 2016, is that uh, we are not getting paid for uh, the, the landfill. Deep uh, owns and operates the landfill here in Hartford, and that um, contaminated uh, groundwater that discharged to the treatment plant in Hartford. Uh, we have a fee associated with that, 13 cents per gallon. The state has yet to pay us for that. So this year, it's uh, $1.9 million that we're not receiving in revenue. Um, the prior years, the change in the rates last year, it was $4 million. They owe us about nine and a half. So that money is directly impacting our town's Avalon budget by lack of revenue collected. Um, we're also going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, water main. Uh, January of 2018, we had 100 water main breaks. We were only installing an, uh, about a, a mile and a half of water mains uh, a year. We have 1,500 miles of water main. We should, by all rights, be doing 10%, which is impossible. Uh, it, it's not affordable. Uh, we're not even doing 1%. 1% is 150 miles. We need to do more. We need to improve the system. Um, otherwise, we're going to be uh, uh, most of the debt service that the towns are paying is going to be for emergency repairs for lineal feet of pipe, not miles of pipe. Um, we're also going to talk a little bit about uh, the study, uh, Raftelis study, which was uh, to get the, the concept of getting rid of Avalorum. Uh, and uh, we do have a budgetary item on the water bill for uh, litigation settlement with the non-member towns uh, that we'll talk about. Riverfront transition, we just talked about that uh, uh, today. And uh, one thing we haven't even really started to talk about, which is really important, is we're improving the sewer system through the Clean Water Program. But our water system is 150 years old. So the uh, West, uh, West Hartford treatment plant is 150 years old. The raw water mains to the reservoirs are the same age. And we, those uh, West Hartford treatment plant and the, um, the Bloomfield plant can serve about 150 uh, uh, million gallons a day. We're only using, we're only, we're only selling 47. So we've got a big decision to make over the next 30 years. And the question is, what do we invest in in our water system? Um, so just jumping to the, the, to the important thing, which is um, the budget. Without getting into a lot of details, um, we were at 11%. So you can see in that last column on the right, uh, you can see that increase of 11%. Um, if you look down at the, the bottom right-hand column, uh, we have uh, the increase now at 6.9. How we got there, uh, as you can see, um, there's a customer service charge uh, listed on both scenarios. In 2018, um, there's a lot of private property work that the sewer Avalorum pays for. For example, all of the customer service uh, command center emergency response at 2 o'clock in the morning uh, working on a private sewer lateral because a homeowner has tree roots in their, in their lateral. Any work that we do on the private property is paid for through Avalorum. And the logic was, why don't we create a customer service charge like the water rate, which actually generates revenue. $3 generates about $3 million. So the $6 uh, dollar rate that we have here generated $6 million. That gets removed directly off of Avalorum. So th that's a revenue to the towns is, is uh, the way we, uh, we budget it. So what we're proposing is to increase that customer service charge on the suicide to $7. Adds $1. It's approximately uh, a 2% reduction. We also have some budgetary items on the clean water project where the MDC reimburses itself for administrative uh, services, which helps us reduce the remainder. Uh, so that's how we got down to uh, the 6.9%. This is just a... Uh, um, a, uh, a water um, rate uh, structure which, which uh, compares the member town versus non-member towns. As you can see, the, the end result is, um, based on uh, the water uh, 
for member towns, there's an increase of 8.7%, and the non-member towns increase is 10.71%, but you can see the delta, the dollars uh, increase, is lower on the non-member town. That's mainly associated with the clean water surcharge. The, thank you. The clean water surcharge, uh, non-member towns do not pay. So there's $410, um, as you can see, there's $410 that is not charged to the non-member towns. The member towns have to pay that rate. That's for the clean water, that's for the clean water project. Uh, we like to always explain uh, things that we're doing in, in each of our towns. And uh, Weathersfield specifically, 32% uh, of the system has been rehabilitated since 2005. Um, recent projects that we completed, we're doing lots of relining of sewer pipes, so that's taking an existing pipe and simply putting a liner inside that's going to uh, be uh, extend the life of that of that pipe by anywhere from 75 to 100 years. And uh, so we do that a lot within our within our towns. Uh, the Golf Park. Uh, overflow uh, closure project, which just finished up, approximately $30 million. And the Rocky Hill treatment plant, as you know, about 62% or so of the sewer from Wethersfield goes to the Rocky Hill treatment plant. Um, we have uh, just some pictures up there of the, um, of the tunnel, the top picture on the, on the, on the, uh, on the left. Uh, it, it looks like it's upside down, but it's actually a uh, 18 foot diameter concrete tunnel and that's the tunnel that we're building uh, we're building excess capacity to pick up the overflows uh, to uh, to the Wethersfield Cove and to uh, other tributaries uh, to the right is just a, is one of the drop shafts that we use to to actually access the tunnel which is approximately 250 feet deep and then there's just some other pictures of some of the project uh, that you you can see the bottom middle is uh, the Gulf Brook Overflow project that you you endured. Thank you very much for the last uh, number of uh, two years. Um, this again is um, just a picture of the tunnel itself. Uh, again, it's about four miles, a little over four miles. We're about 6,900 feet into the tunnel. Um, the the goal of this tunnel is to serve two purposes. One is it's to collect the CSOs along the route within Hartford, but it's also to go into uh, Newington and West Hartford to pick up the SSOs. Uh, as you know, in Hartford, the sewer system is a combined system, so the sewer and the stormwater was designed to be in the same pipe. In our other seven towns, it's separated, so they cannot be and should not be storm and sewer together. However, there is for a lot of other reasons. Um, and so our goal with this tunnel is instead of uh, to try and get the stormwater out, uh, the mandate from, from DEEP and EPA was, no, we don't want to wait for 40 years for you to separate and replace this infrastructure, so you must build, in a sense, a tunnel to collect it quicker. And that's really the difference between integrated planning and what we're doing here in the, in the southern part of the, uh, the city. So. Uh, the, the, if you look at the right-hand part of the screen, uh, the, little red, um, the little red line, uh, that's Franklin Avenue. So most of the overflows that go to the Wethersfield Cove, there's five of them, they come from the uh, Franklin Avenue. Um, and um, one of our, um, our challenges is when we were designing this tunnel uh, was to size the tunnel. And the tunnel size is uh, dictated by how much storm and, and sewers going into it. So I remember I just got done saying we're only selling 47 million gallons of water a day, but so they, we, therefore theoretically we should have about 47 million gallons of sewer a day. But the challenge is on a wet day the plant in, in South Meadows is seeing 200 million gallons a day, and that's because of stormwater some way somehow getting into our system this is to simply collect it all and treat it all which is not the the best way to do it it's not an integrated approach but it's the quickest way that uh, that was mandated by deep and and epa so so our goal um is to is to not do this anymore not build capacity but utilize the money that we have 
the affordability factor. The money that our towns have to spend on sewer and water, let's use it as, as uh, judiciously as we can. Let's find a way to fix the pipes in the streets. Uh, if everyone remembers, uh, when I first got here in 2006, um, we had, I had a, a gentleman calling me from uh, Fair Lane Drive. And he was on the corner of Fair Lane and uh, Griswold. And I think his gentleman's name was Sim, started S-I-M something, Sim, Simonian or, anyways. That, that family and everyone up Fair Lane Drive would have toilet paper all over their yards when we had a major storm. And, and the problem was the Clean Water Project, we were looking at highways. We're building big highways, highways. we're being, building tunnels. We're looking at just picking up the overflows where they overflow uh, at, the, at, you know, at the Connecticut River or Trout Brook or uh, the Wethersfield Cove. We're not really focused on fixing the pipes in front of your street. That wasn't the intent of the Clean Water Project and the mandates from DEEP. So I asked the engineers to go back and reanalyze uh, Randy Lane and, and say, I'm sorry, uh, Fairlane Drive and say, but we have a problem right now and these people are gonna wait. Almost everybody on Fairlane had a, a grinder pump. They have to pump their sewer into the uh, sewer pipe because it would get full of everything and, and it wouldn't work. So we shifted gears and we built the Randy Lane project, which you were probably familiar with, and that actually immediately eliminated the problems on Fairlane. That's what we're talking about when we talk about integrated planning, building tunnels. This tunnel that we're building right now, uh, we had a debate with the town, with the legislature, with, uh, with DEEP, over how big the tunnel is and what size storm do you plan for when you're uh, assuming uh, it's gonna rain. Is it a, a one-year storm? Is it a five-year storm? Is it a hundred-year storm? The larger the storm, the bigger the tunnel gets. So we were required to build a tunnel that was, would eliminate the overflows to the West Field Cove. Never, ever occur. And that cost about $100 million. So just looking at uh, you know, what we have to do, uh, the remaining work that we need to do in Wethersfield is $91 million. So 22% uh, of the collection system, 27 miles, um, you build capacity in tunnels, but you've got these other projects that you have to do. You still have to afford both. And um, that's the challenge that we're having uh, at the MDC with educating our towns to say, instead of building a tunnel, let's fix the $90 million in Wethersfield, the $100 million in West Hartford, Let's fix the problem. Let's get the stormwater out rather than build big tunnels to collect it. Uh, this is just uh, um, a, an example of integrated planning. So we talk about tunnels. We're going to build lots of tunnels, and they're going to cost lots of money. Our tunnel is the tunnel we're building in, in the South Meadows, four miles. It's around $600 million. Um, but if you look at Capon Street in Hartford, this is our reality. So. Um, when we, when we do, when we're not replacing existing infrastructure and building larger tunnels, when do we have the time and the money to afford to fix the pipes of the streets? 15, uh, 1,200 miles of sewer pipe. When do we find the, the extra money to do that? The longer we wait to do that, the older the system gets. And these numbers just represent emergency repairs. The uh, Avalorum has no control over this. Towns have no control over it. Emergency, it's got to get fixed. There's no if, ands, or buts about it. So uh, we would rather replace water mains and sewer pipes through bidding them, building, you know, in the case of uh, the Gulf Brook, 5,000 feet of pipe, you know, for $30 million versus um, replacing 20 feet and 30 feet in 2019, we had $21 million budgeted for CIP sewer pipe. Of that, $8 million, a third of the budget of that CIP account was for emergency repairs only. So if you think about it, if we're budgeting $20 million and we're spending eight on just emergency repairs, if we do nothing, that emergency repair number will get larger and larger and larger, and then you're replacing 
um, you know, feet of pipe, not miles of pipe. So this is just a, a couple of pictures of Homestead Avenue. On the right is a, is a good example. Uh, you know, it's a 26 foot deep sewer. Uh, we replaced about 26 feet of pipe for, for $680,000. Um, and that's not what we want to do. In our integrated plan, we propose for that very pipe, that very pipe, the proposal is we have to line it. We have to do something with it because it's falling apart. We could line it for two to five million dollars or we could replace it and increase the size of it and utilize it to, re to collect one of the overflows to the north branch of the Park River, which is similar to the, to the, to the Weathersfield Cove issue. So that's our logic of integrated planning. Use the existing infrastructure to meet the regulatory mandate and you're really spending the money on the existing infrastructure rather than building larger tunnels. Um, this is something uh, that uh, it really hit home in our town manager meetings this year. Um, the question is, I know the town council of Wethersfield and uh, West Hartford didn't take action on supporting the integrated plan. Um, the challenge is, the longer the integrated plan doesn't get approved, uh, if you remember, we had a referendum in 2006 and 2012, which was um, $800 million each. So we were authorized and have been authorized to spend $1.6 billion. We have committed all of that money. The tunnel that we're building right now is, has eaten up the remainder of that $1.6 billion. We are in a lag because we submitted the integrated plan to the state in December of, of, of this past year. We're waiting. We just received comments from them. Um, our anticipation is it could take up to three years uh, if we don't have um, approval from the state. Then we need a referendum for more work. And the challenge is going to be the, if we don't have all of our towns supporting the integrated plan, what's going to happen is we're mandated to do certain things even without a referendum. So we have two uh, regulatory mandates. State of Connecticut regulated all of the work in Hartford and EPA regulate, uh, mandated all the work in the other seven towns. EPA says and, uh, and they mandate that we do minimal amounts of work on our what we call CMON program which is basically the lining work that we've talked about fixing the old pipe get the stormwater out that's our our minimum mandate. So without a referendum without an integrated planning approved we have no, no other funding source to do that. So the only funding source is we're now going to have to, until we get approval and referendum, we're going to have to put those projects that, that EPA mandates we do on Avalorum. This year, we have, uh, we have identified a $14.6 million. And, and, the, and the problem with that is once the towns pay for this kind of work, we'll never get reimbursed from the state. So if it takes us three years to get approval and we do five, 10, 20 million dollars worth of work uh, that was mandated by EPA, the state won't reimburse us. We won't get any grants. Uh, the grants help us tremendously in, re in reducing the cost, the overall cost to the customers. Uh, and then this is just a little um, uh, expectation for the years to follow. These are, these are uh, CMOM rehab type projects that will have to be done uh, on the backs of Avalorum rather than being paid for by the Clean Water Project, which would be we proposed under the integrated plan. Um, the, we have uh, some discussions with Bond Council about do, does the MDC have the right to utilize our $20 million rule, which is our legislative uh, uh, limit on, on doing projects without a referendum approval. And uh, we're working on that, uh, but right now uh, our only solution and source of funding for those projects will be the Avalorum. Um, th this is just a chart. This is an average for all of our towns. And th two important things. This is just spread over to 2060. So the Clean Water Project is approximately $2.5 billion. Uh, which, which repre are represented in the blues. And Avalorum is green, and that is we are spending approximately 35, 
to $50 million a year on, on, on just CIP projects, so non-clean water related, uh, except for what I just mentioned, that we'll have to do uh, CMOM projects that uh, are, we're mandated to do by EPA, which are not included in, in this chart. The important part of this is the first line of each, of each year is what we are doing right now. We've got green Avalorum. That's what the equivalent charge is to a customer for us to provide sewer service to a resident or a business in, in your town. And then the blue is the cost of the clean water project. Uh, the second um, scenario, so, so, the, so the first scenario is build big tunnels, collect <laughs> everything, and spend $35 million of debt service on on, on, on the 1,200 miles of sewer pipe in your towns. The, the second scenario is the complete opposite. It's, it, the logic is not about catching the overflows and the stormwater. It's about rehabbing the existing pipes and using that to get the stormwater out. And therefore, um, the end result is that it's cheaper. It's simple. It's cheaper for the customers uh, to utilize an integrated plan. And it's not so much, it's what we're spending the money on. Because if you spend the money on tunnels, you still have to find the resources and the monies to pay for the Fairlane drives. You still have to fix those pipes that are not, they're either falling apart or they're, um, or, you know, the Homestead Avenue projects that I had mentioned. This is a specific slide, and we did this for all of our towns, for the town of Wethersfield. So as you can see, the integrated plan, uh, what we are proposing every year is cheaper for your taxpayers. Uh, and again, it's, it's, it varies by town, uh, and it's all about, it's really about what we're spending the money on. Um, that's the important part of this discussion. Now, I had heard from uh, I had talked to the town manager in Rocky Hill, and there was a number of issues uh, when I think when, you know, Avalorum at, at the first meeting was 15 percent, 11 percent. And I know there's a lot of discussion from some of the councilmen and women uh, in Rocky Hill that uh, they really wanted to look at an analysis of should we go on our own? Should we have our own water treatment system and wastewater treatment system? So I'm not sure if that's, uh, that's a discussion point here, but I just want to show some rough numbers um, of, of the costs uh, in, associated with running a wastewater treatment plant. And I don't even have on here the regulatory requirements that, that, I've been, that the MDC is paying for. Now remember, all of the clean water project funds are being paid for by all eight towns. If Wethersfield and or Rocky Hill were to go in it alone, then, then you would have to pay for that yourselves. But this is just a, a rough cost of what the uh, Rocky Hill Wastewater Treatment Plan is. 62% of the sewer from Wethersfield goes to Rocky Hill Treatment Plan. 100 to $150 million, I would say that that's much higher than, than $150 million. Annual operating budget, $1.7 million. Uh, remaining capital improvements, $12 million. Uh, you can see these numbers are very large. Um, if you look down at the bottom, you can see what your Avalorum costs are. Um, but I, in my slide, previous slide, I showed there's a mandate of $91 million that we must improve 22% of the sewer system in Wethersfield. So that is a, is a number that everyone is sharing. Uh, East Hartford is getting no benefit to the Clean Water Project. There's no benefit, but the, yet they're paying equal shares uh, as everyone here in Wethersfield or Rocky Hill or West Hartford is paying. And that's what regionalism is all about, right? Uh, we, the same thing happened when, when we did the treatment plant in East Hartford back in the 80s. Everyone paid for that. So this is something that is, uh, is, is, is reality. Um, there's a lot of expenses here. I won't get into them, but if there's any questions, we can talk about it after. This is just a, uh, a slide showing Rocky Hill and the, uh, the blue areas uh, in Wethersfield uh, flow to the Rocky Hill treatment plant. Um, about 38% uh, go to, in Wethersfield, go to the Hartford treatment plant. 
This is just a, uh, an actual bill, uh, very similar uh, uh, in terms of uh, the comparison between the non-member towns and member towns. Mm. <laughs> but basically, the, um, the, uh, the, the rate is based on, um, this is our, uh, a residential uh, customer, um, and uh, they have a, a 5 eighths meter, so it's a small meter. Those rates vary based on the size of the meter. Uh, but you can see here that this is a current monthly charge of $66. Uh, we will be adding um, 25 cents in the federal and state regulatory compliance mandate. We will be adding that fee uh, to collect for the future settlement with the non-member towns on the customer service charge. And um, this, this is um, uh, just... Uh, a comparison of our cells and the regional uh, water utilities in the state and then the private water utilities in the state. We are very similar to uh, Connecticut Water Authority. They are identical to us. They were, they were created by the legislature. Uh, the only difference is they have two separate entities. The sewer and the water are not combined like MDC is. Uh, so the regional water authority only does water. Their water rate this year is 90 cents higher than our water rate. Our water rate this year is proposed to go to $4.01. So even without any increases, we're still cheaper than everybody else. The challenge that we have is, as you all know, the clean water surcharge is really making a huge difference on uh, actual consumption because of their bills going up and the, and the total bill. So that's uh, it for the presentation. Um, I'd be willing to answer any questions if you have. Um, I do have uh, staff here. Chris Martin is our new uh, CFO, and Jason Waterbury is our engineer. If there's any questions. Uh... Counselors? Counselor Latina, how are you this evening? Good, how are you? Thanks for the presentation. No problem. What is the next step in your budgetary process? Um, so I'm going to go back uh, to that first slide, and uh, um, we we just had another budget meeting with our uh, with our uh, board of finance uh, this just at noon time. Uh, so as you can see here, we're trying to finalize our budget. We're uh, we talked about Riverfront. We have uh, in last year's in last year's uh, resolution, we proposed to reduce uh, Riverfront. Our resolution was passed to reduce res Riverfront uh, 162,000 a year every year for four years to get down to 600,000. Right presently, it's uh, 1.25 million dollars. So that was a discussion today. Um, OPEB Trust, although our, our um, although our um, uh, board has already approved a eight-year plan, and I know Becky Seelman was here. Uh, the same night she came to our, uh, our board meeting. Um, and uh, as you know, OPEB is, is uh, our biggest liability, everyone's biggest liability. Our, our, we, we pay as you go, and our pay as you go bill is $9.5 million a year. Um, so we've been told GASB 75, everyone probably has been made aware of that, you now you must do something. What is something? Uh, we looked at a number of different options. We looked at a, uh, a uh, six-year plan, an eight-year plan. That We've had commissioners ask us to look at a 10-year plan. Presently, what was adopted was an eight-year plan, which starts out at uh, $468,000. It's not the first year that's the problem. It's not the second year. It's the third and the fourth and the fifth. It escalates very quickly to get up to $5 million. So as Becky has probably told you, the pr challenge with OPEB is they need to be able to justify and assume a certain um, discount rate. And a discount rate is what saves you, the town, or us, the MDC, money. So our liability, our future liability for OPEB right now, 30 years from now, is $300 million. If we develop an OPEB trust and they can, can swear by that it truly is a, uh, it's a reasonable program to get to a reasonable, um, you know, uh, first payment that um, that they could and will consider including a six and three quarter uh, discount rate. That discount rate dictates 
you know, the liability. So it goes from $300 million down to $200 million. But it still is a major financial commitment that um, the towns and or the MDC will, will make. Uh, because if you just stop paying and you say, I can't afford the, the, the payment this year, then what's going to happen is they're going to say, okay, well, we, we, can't, um, we, we can't qualify that as utilizing a discount rate of, of six and three quarters. It might have to be 2%. So that's a discussion that's been going on. We're still going to have a, a – they've asked, our board asked to look at a 10-year uh, implementation of a first payment. Um, and we're going to look at that um, in the next month. We also, um, uh, one of our uh, discussion points today, which is we need to bring more data to the, the, the Board of Finance, is um, the way in which we pay for the Clean Water Project, so this $2.5 billion program, uh, as, you, as you know, there's a clean water surcharge on your water bill, and that, water, that rate has been pre-developed based on the project, based on the projects that have been approved by DEEP and the time frame of those projects. And we need to have enough cash in the um, rate stabilization account that we can actually pay the, the contractors and the engineers and all those good things. So, um, but the challenge that we have this year, which we didn't have between referendums one and two, we're gonna have, we've spent all of our money uh, we've committed all of that, that $1.6 billion, and now we have to decide we most likely have at least a two-year delay because uh, it, we could have th three or four, depending on how long it takes to get this integrated and planning approved, but if DEEP takes two years the way that they took for the 2014 long-term control plan, and then you have another year of, 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 of referendum, that's, two, that's a three-year delay. So the question to the board is, do we keep the rate, which is $4.10 per CCF, flat for at least this year with an anticipation of no activity uh, with approval? Um, so we're, we've got uh, a bunch of discussions going on with those kinds of issues. The, the schedule, as you can see here, um, there's a number of, of public hearings that were mandated to hold for water rates. And um, uh, the, the board will finally decide on December uh, 2nd at the board meeting uh, to adopt the budget as approved. So there's, there's still a number, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven meetings that have to occur uh, before the budget's adopted. So uh, just a couple of observations. Um, as far as the customer service charge is, you were saying that the ad valorem pays for any kind of lateral breaks. Why isn't that the homeowner's responsibility? Because I know there's companies out there that insure that type of thing. Yeah, so that we don't. So, uh, so what I, what I what, but the, the problem is, is that the MDC, and I'll use an example. Let's say it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a lateral uh, on a, pr a private property and there's root intrusion and it just, it, it, they, it needs to be replaced. So <laughs> MDC has staff that although the, the homeowner pays a private contractor to replace that, we still inspect it to make sure it's done the way in which our, to our standards. So that's a free, it's free. That there's no charge for that. So this customer service charge was meant to capture that kind of activity that we're providing uh, private property owners and the towns are paying for it. So that's why that customer service charge was developed in the first place. And so we're not, we're not paying for the lateral, the replacement. Thanks for the clarification. Sure. Um, the other thing was on the CMOM and the MS4 mandates. Can't those be bonded for through the stormwater authority that's now currently at the legislative process? Uh, so two separate issues. Uh, yeah. So CMOM is basically um, a mandate from EPA, as I mentioned, for the seven towns, not Hartford. And yes, we are capitalizing that work. Um, there's a lot of maintenance on the maintenance side that's built into Avalorum that is not capitalized because it's maintenance. But everything we can capitalize, we are under CMOM. The question becomes who pays for it? Is it the clean water surcharge uh, on the water bill that's paying for that? Or is it the, because we don't have approval for the integrated plan and therefore we don't have 
the authority to go for referendum and therefore we don't have any additional funding to pay for it, the only source of funding would be capitalizing it through Avalorum. So um, that's what we're proposing, uh, that the $14.6 million we're proposing, that'll be capitalized, but it will be, but it will be charged to Avalorum, not to the clean water surcharge. Okay, that might be a question for Deep, because sure. I know they're working on something. Yes. Um, and my last, um, question was the folks that live along that Gough Brook project that just was completed, were any of them, um, did they get anything for allowing all that staging to be in their front yard for two years? It seems as though those folks deserve a little break. <laughs> yeah, um, so I just uh, um, uh, drove that uh, site uh, today before I got here and uh, the, you know, it is painful uh, to to endure construction activity, especially sewer utility work in the road. And uh, when we were doing all the separation work in Hartford, the same discussion occurred with the businesses. A lot of businesses, that's why we got away, away from separation because one, the, the state and EPA would not give us a long enough time to, uh, to do the, the, um, the separation work. We were doing five projects within a five block radius a hundred million dollars worth of work. It literally stopped mm -hmm. the business. It, people could, couldn't park. Most of the people in Farm, uh, Franklin Avenue park on the street. Mm -hmm. So they, there was a big concern about, you know, can we be reimbursed? And the answer is we can't use federal monies to reimburse anyone. If there's an easement or there's anything that, uh, that uh, we've utilized, a lot of the contractors will pay a resident to utilize their lot if they have to store pipe or equipment but we cannot reimburse customers with federal money uh, for the inconvenience. Uh, the, 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 what Golf Brook basically did was, was basic, the project basically, it split the original Golf Brook uh, trunk sewer that goes to the plant, which wasn't big enough, it split it in two. It sends it in two different you know, directions so that, um, so that we're, we're reducing the, the impact, the overflows to people's basements. Um, so there's a huge benefit. I understand it's, it's painful to live through, uh, but we have no ability to reimburse people for their inconvenience. Not necessarily reimbursement, but you guys kind of have control over the bills. Couldn't you just waive them? No. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Other questions, Deputy Mayor? Uh, just a few comments. Uh, Scott, I've had the pleasure of sitting in on your past three meetings uh, and listening to everything. And thank you, number one, for getting that 15.9% down to 6.9. But uh, also remember the uh, town manager from Bloomfield said anything above 6% is unrealistic. My personal opinion, I'd like to see it down to around three because I see the cost of living increases coming out this year for Social Security and retirements is like 1.6, but that's just an FYI. Um, there's not much I can do. This is my last meeting. I'm not running again, so I won't be up here on the dais afterwards. But last year, we did not agree with you on the integrated plan, just as a statement, because we knew it could pass, but we had stuff we wanted to get done that we weren't being listened to at the meetings. I've been there, I've listened. Uh, I said last year, and I'll say it again this year, that the integrated plan fiscally makes sense. And I have no problem saying to the rest of the people on the dais when they come back, they should vote in favor of the, of the uh, integrated plan and we should get our uh, legislator involved to help you get DEP to pay their back and whatever. So you know, from that standpoint, I'm with you. Uh, as far as the uh, OPEC, I have to be dis in disagreement with you and your actuary. I think eight or a 10 year plan is very, very unrealistic. The towns on their own have gone to a 25 or 30 year thing to do it. Uh, and yeah, you might get a better rate, but over the past six years, I've sat in on the discussions when we've gone out for bonds with the bonding underwriter to listen to everything. And he knows we're doing it over a period of time. And we started, we started with like $400,000 a year, saying we would increase it every year 
by 200,000 until we hit up to like, I think it was 1.6 or 1.8. I can't remember right now. <coughs> so that they knew we had a plan and we were sticking to it. And because of that, they gave us a favorable rating because we showed we had a plan, even though it was going longer than, you know, yeah. they would like, at least we had a plan. And our OPEG right now is probably around 14, 15% funded. Which I think is better than a lot of towns. Sure. Okay, and I mean it started out because originally, before when Gatsby came in, uh, there was zero in that fund, but within the pension fund was 2.8 million of money for OPEB that we transferred out and put in. So that was a start. And over the years, like I say, we've increased the 200. Plus, on the years we're self-insured, like you are, when we had a good year, any extra funds we had went into OPEB to get it up and higher. So my comment and my suggestion is don't listen to your actuary. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> I've got concerns with her anyway, okay? <laughs> We've had discussions between her and I. Right. But go with a you know, 20, 25 year plan, show you've got a gradual increase coming every year and that you're gonna get it fully funded yep. over that long time period. Your bonding underwriters will not penalize you for that mm. because you're doing something realistic. I mean, because if all the towns are working on that premise, MDC should be doing the same thing because the biggest part of our increases over the past few years have been all mandates that we couldn't right. you know, control. And one of those is the MDC rates we get for ad valorem and increases from the other utilities and other different things. So. When you go into your budget process, please, please look at expanding that out further, showing a, an increase each year. It will not affect your bond rating. Right. The underwriters will look favorably on you because <laughs> to me, eight years is overkill and it's hurting our people because we got a lot of people in this town that are on fixed incomes or young people just starting out and we just can't keep going up and up and up and the biggest part of our increases are, you know, like I say, mandates, things like ad valorem, you know, the bonding we've got now and stuff yeah. like that. So whatever you can do to expand that, I'd appreciate it. And like I say, I'm an advocate for you now. I, I've listened to everything. The integrated plan, I, yes, you're right. In the long run, it will save us money. I have no problem after this month even going back as a private citizen talking to our legislature, say that, you know, fight for you guys to get you the money out of the EP that they owe you and, and you know, get your plan approved and get it to move forward. So I just wanted thank, to, Thank you. Know. you. And, and I just, I've said this at the town manager meetings, I've said it at the budget. Uh, it's imperative that uh, for us to be um, uh, debating the integrated plan. Now, as you, uh, you may or may not be aware, uh, integrated planning was, was, was a guideline from EPA developed in 2012, but Congress just passed a law in January that mandates that integrated planning be considered as part of long-term control planning. So we have that on our side, but without all eight towns support, uh, it's, it, you know, it's very difficult to, um, unfortunately the regulators want it and they want it now. They don't want to wait. And uh, so tunnels are really the only solution to picking up that overflow. Yes, it will take longer. Uh, we don't wanna create what happened on, on Franklin Avenue and Albany Avenue where we shut the businesses down. The, the issues that you experience in Gulf Brook, we don't wanna have five projects going on um, uh, off the Silestine Highway. We, want, we need the time to spread these projects out over the course of 40 years. Uh, you know, th there's a logic that you know, the, the, the improvements that we're making to the system are for the next generation, so why should this generation pay for 100% of it? So there's a lot of logic to that, and, uh, but the sooner uh, Wethersfield and West Hartford support the integrated plan, the, the better um, uh, legs the MDC will stand on when, as we're ne when ne negotiating with them. Um, but thank you, appreciate it. Well, like I say, this is the last meeting we're having before the election, so it would have to be up the next council and you know I would advocate towards them putting something through so that you guys could uh, you know move forward with the educate you know the integrated plan 
you know, I can't speak for West Hartford, but I think Wethersfield should, you know, move forward on it. And, you know, please, please consider what I said about we OPEP. Will. We're, uh, we're going to have a, uh, we just talked about it today. We're going to have another workshop because we have a few items still left. That, that, that workshop's not on this schedule. We're going to shoot for early part of November or the later part of October to talk about OPEB, to talk about the, the clean water surcharge and some of the other outstanding items in the budget. And like I say, when you have these with Becky, if you have a problem and you want me there, I'll be glad to go toe to toe oh. with her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Are there any other questions from council members? Councilor Rell? Thank you, uh, and thank you, Scott. Um, how realistic is it that the state's gonna reimburse the $9 million? Well, so um, I, I, would, I would tell you this, is that uh, uh, we've got a lot going on with uh, the state uh, in terms of integrated planning, in terms of this um, groundwater surcharge from the landfill. Uh, we've got a lot of issues. But PFAS, the, the chemical that's coming from the landfill. But, the, you know, if everyone remembers CRA. But, but the one thing that the only leverage that we have is you. Deep's not going to do anything. Deep is a very politically organized animal. They, they listen to the environmentalists, and that's it. And so if they don't hear from the towns, uh, we talked about Avalorum. The deputy mayor said, I'd like to see it zero. It would be zero. It'd be negative if the, t if the state of Connecticut paid its bill. Can you imagine the, sta the state of Connecticut not paying its electric bill? Pratt & Whitney is paying the same exact fee it's 3.8, 3.6 million dollars every year. They're paying. Uh, this fee that we're charging is de derived from a environmental permit that Deep issues. Deep says you got a contaminated uh, ground associated with a well. Uh, I'm sorry, associated with a gas station, associated with any uh, industrial activity. You must clean up that site. How do you clean it up? Well, you got to pump the groundwater out until such time that they feel that you've cleaned up the mess. So the answer is you got to issue a permit. Deep issues them at what they call an individual permit. The individual permit requires the POTW, the publicly owned treatment works, which is the MDC, to sign off that will accept that. So everybody who wants to discharge contaminated groundwater to the MDC, they have to get our permission. The state doesn't feel they need our permission. How long has this been going on? Um, Five, so, six years? Yeah, so we, we discovered the discharge in 2016. It's actually been going on since the, the 90s. But we didn't initiate the rate for this groundwater discharge until 2007. If everyone, anyone remembers, we had an $800,000 fine imposed on us by the state of Connecticut and, and, and EPA because of the Clean Water Act. And so that uh, in itself initiated us in 2007 to say, okay, groundwater is the problem, bad, get it out the best we can. Contaminated groundwater we don't want, so let's impose a feed structure which has been at the treatment plant. People can bring this contaminated groundwater in a truck, they bring it to the treatment plant, we charge them 13 cents a gallon, they dump it in the plant and we treat it. We created this we didn't want these, uh, in, these discharges that were being initiated by deep environmental permitting procedures. So we said, let's create that fee for people discharging it to the sewer system. And it's really a deterrent to get people to, it, typically what it's used for is a gas station has to pump the water for three or four months, they get it clean, and then it stops. And that's really what the intent was. But long-term dischargers like Pratt and & Whitney and like the, the landfill, um, the landfill was used by 80 or more communities. Why is eight towns paying for the, for the sins of 80 communities? But you are. You're paying for all of it. And so the answer is, right, so, so the answer is we need your support to, uh, to show the, the state that you want to see this, uh, this reimbursement as well. Um, we have, for the churches and the nonprofits in your towns, we, have, we create what we call a, um, a sewer user charge, which is an equivalent to Avalorum. So churches don't pay taxes, so they pay us 
an equivalency which is going to be five dollars and thirteen cents this year per CCF of the sewer they discharge to us. Deep feels that they don't want to pay thirteen cents a gallon; they want to pay um, the sewer user charge for that same ninety million uh, ninety thousand gallons of water a day. They want us to pay that that rate structure. It's much cheaper. They're not even paying the rate that we have. So they're paying a rate that's $2.70, which is like 2016 rate. They've told us we're not paying you. So that's about a $200,000 loss, even on their logic, their budgetary logic of what they should be paying us. They've refused to pay us anything more than what they've been paying us since 2016 okay. until this issue gets resolved. So long end of it, Yes, we're not getting it. Well, I, I can't say we're not getting it. There's a lot right. of discussion going on. Um, and uh, we're hopeful that uh, if we do get it, that money would automatically, it's, there, uh, there's already been a resolution passed two years ago, or three years ago, that money would go to reduce Avalorum yeah. for the town. So I, I doubt we'll see the full nine million at any single one shot. What is the overall budget, annual budget for the MDC? For, uh, if I, like next two slides, for yeah, we, it, 45 it, million? It, well, that's, what, that's the tax on town. So, the, the budget is approximately eight, $98 million for water, $98 million, roughly for $96 million for sewer. When you subtract all of the revenues um, uh, that we're receiving, so setage and sludge from other communities, we, we generate about $6 million in revenue. So that, the, the cost to the towns is, I think, $47 million approximately. Yeah. Of the $9 million, however, it would be broken down. I mean, it's not going to... It's not going to make a huge difference in an overall budget, uh, annual budget. I mean, I don't see them. Nine million would wipe out. There would be no increase. There'd be zero increase. That's if we get nine million in one shot. Yes, but but so five hundred thousand is one percent. So if you get a million, you can reduce by two percent. You're at six percent. You would uh, you would easily uh, reduce the the Avalon. Right. Yep. Right. Yeah. Unfortunately, I don't see that happening anytime right. soon. Well, we're, we're hopeful. Yep. And Would you speak in the microphone because we have people at home watching that won't be able to hear. Uh, good evening. Chris Stone, Assistant District Counsel. Just very briefly, uh, Councilman Rall, on your questions relating to the legal aspect of this thing. We have two things going on against Deep. One is an action before the state claims commissioner to collect on the 9.2, the back uh, payments that we feel are due. Uh, we got hit with a motion to dismiss from, from Deep on that case. That's been pending with the state, with the claims commissioner for about six, six months now. So she's not, unfortunately not under the same time frame that a, a superior court judge would be. They only have four months to rule. So she, uh, the claims commissioner has been waiting, we're waiting on, on their decision. The second action we've, ta we've taken is uh, an injunctive and declaratory judgment action directly against Deep in the Superior Court. We also have a motion to dismiss pending there. We had argument last Thursday on that. The judge has four months to rule on that. The bottom line is uh, both steps along the way, and I won't speak for Deep, but I'll speak about Deep. It seems like they want to avoid the ultimate question, which is whether any money's due at all, and sit on either whether it be sovereign immunity in one case or trying to dismiss our action before the Claims Commission in the other case without dealing fundamentally with whether they sh should pay. We feel they should pay. That, that fee's been in existence even before 2007. There was another fee that was being paid by CRA. This was a new fee that was developed uh, by the NBC in 2007 to address many things, not the least of which is to disincentivize people or entities from dumping this into our mm -hmm. system, to your system. So uh, we feel we have uh, ample authority to impose the fee. We feel we have ample authority to not only impose, but also change the fee over time. In fact, we did that in 2018. We went to a tiered system, which re would reduce the liability for the state of Connecticut, for Pratt Whitney, and for others who avail themselves of this opportunity to dump their contaminated groundwater in our system. This is important not just for the 9.2. This is important because they're going to be dumping 85, approximately 85 gallons, 85,000 gallons of contaminated groundwater into our system for years to come. So it's not just the what's- The landfill? The or landfill. The DEP? The landfill. landfill. Deep. Okay. So it's That's not- on average. on average. It's not just what we've 
uh, uh, been unable to collect in the past, but it's being able to collect prospectively, which would have an annual impact on the ad valorem for many years to come. Mm -hmm. And we don't, uh, this is not to blame the state, you know, state deep took over the landfill from CRA. Um, and so it's not, we're not blaming the state. Our only point is why should our eight towns pay for this when 80 communities used it? So why is it our responsibility? And as we saw what happened at the, the airport and the tragedy at the airport and this whole issue that came up with PFAS and when the, uh, the, the discharge from the airport uh, happened um, uh, this, this past summer, um, we didn't know what PFAS was. And uh, so now we realize that through Deep's own words, that PFAS, the number one source of PFAS is from landfills. They knew that, we didn't know that. Now we do. But now the question is, again, if, you, um, uh, if you're aware, Congress passed another law that said PFAS will be considered as part of the Clean Water Act. What does that mean? It means the people who own the treatment plant are going to wind up paying to get rid of PFAS. So we have 80 communities that are now discharging uh, one of the largest um, quantities of PFAS to the Connecticut River, either through the adjacency of the landfill or through discharging a, to, a, to a pipe that comes to our treatment plant. And then we have no way to remove the PFAS from the treatment process. So we, the treatment plant, which is our eight towns, are going to have to bear the burden of getting rid of the largest discharge in the state of PFAS. Uh, why should our eight towns pay for that? Why shouldn't the state of Connecticut pay for that? But um, there's a task force. Uh, there's a lot of people in the industry and the governor's office. They're all engaged in this. And, and there's, there's not a lot of discussion about the landfill. There's a lot of discussion about pizza boxes. And there's a lot of discussion about um, the airport. But there's not a lot of discussion about what are we going to do with removing the PFAS from the landfill. In our discussion with Deep over the groundwater contamination prior to us even aware of PFAS, um, in October of 18, we finally got Deep to agree that they would do a pilot program and they would utilize carbon filters to see if they could remove the contaminants that are in the groundwater sufficient so that it could be discharged directly to the Connecticut River. And therefore, they wouldn't have to send it to us, and we would be happy with that. We didn't find out until the airport's first incident. We asked for the results of that October 18 uh, uh, pilot study, and we found that the, that was PFAS, that they were aware, and they were publicly uh, identified in the papers that DEEP was aware that there was PFAS in the landfill. They had removed the, the standard for PFAS in drinking water by EPA 70 parts per million, trillion, sorry. 70 parts per trillion. Okay, let me just, they, just... They removed it down to 21. They removed it down to 21, and uh, they took the, the, the treatment plant system away, and it's still coming to the plant. Okay, let's, I think we belabored PFAS. Sure. And, the landfill in the state of Connecticut. Um, if we jump up a couple <laughs> more slides uh, to not only the overall of the eight towns, but let's look at Weathersfield in particular where the uh, increases in, um, that's the this state. One? Yep. Yeah, okay. There's the jump between 2020 and 2025 that looks like it's more than any other jumps you know you go from six six ninety to nine seventy then you jump up um and it kind of gradually goes decrease or you know evens out and then kind of you know breaks even um what explains the big jump from 2020 to 2025 it all has to do with projects. So it's a matter of our schedule 
Uh, we have what we refer to as the Bible, and it's the list of projects that we have to achieve by a certain time frame. So this is all about cash flow. Uh, th those bars represent spending money to do certain things within the system on a certain time frame. So that is based on uh, projects. Those represent cash flow to projects. And then the increase from 350 to 401 for the next year, is that to pay for projects as well? Yeah, so our debt service, uh, as you're aware, um, it's increasing dramatically. And our debt service as part of our <laughs> operational budgets, water and sewer, is 30, it's, you know, 35%. We're spending a lot of money. Uh, we, we're, we should be replacing 1%, 150 miles. We're replacing much less than that. So yes, debt service. Uh, and one of the other major factors on the water rate is uh, reduction in consumption. I mean, every residential home is mandated to buy a, a dishwasher, a washing machine, a shower head, a toilet that has a mandated uh, uh, GPM. And so that in itself has reduced the consumption in a household. You know, that's 70% of the reduction. Is, is that, that, that equipment that you now have to buy. Mm -hmm. And then my final point is, or question is, the 25 cent state and federal to, uh, I guess, add on, I guess it was for the mandated, uh, yeah, so we, other town mandated. Non-member town. Non-member so, mandated. Town. Yeah, so yeah. the non-member towns, uh, there, there, there is a lawsuit which in a sense rep is representing the fact that the MDC in 2013 increased. So our member towns pay a, a customer service charge on the water bill, and our non-member towns pay a customer service charge, same customer service charge, and they pay a non-member town customer service charge. Those rates traditionally have been approximately the same. Uh, the non-member town rate was, was, was in existence in the 40s when East Hartford was not, was not even a member of the MDC. So it's, there's, there's historical um, evidence of us maintaining a non-member town rate. In 2013, right or wrong, we increased that rate of the non-member towns from the $35 uh, per quarter to 105. That generated about $2 million in revenue. That $2 million was utilized uh, and was lowered the water rate for everyone all 102,000 customers, including the non-member towns. Uh, there, there is a, we are now faced with um, uh, the possibility of having to reimburse the non-member towns, that delta, for 2014, 15, and part of 2016. We expect that number could be anywhere from seven to $10 million. Legal has uh, recommended that we start collecting now uh, because most likely we will have to pay some amount. And so that's what that 25 cents is. Now, and is that 25 cents on each? Per CCF. So CCF. A, yes. So uh, that Jane and John Doe's six CC. That's right. That's the, yeah. yeah. So if you use six CCF, you're going to get charged oh. that 25 cents. 25 cents per. Per, per yes. So seven and times 25. And state, 50 cent total or 25? No, nope, 25. Just, it's 25. We, we, we believe we, we will collect about five, just under $5 million each year. We need 10. So is that that's, built into the 350 to 401 or is that? No, that's in addition to the 401. Bottom line, what's the percentage each, you know, resident of Wethersfield would be? It was 8.3% 8, 8. Um, 8 increase it, on the From water. the slide with the the full budget increase? Yeah, I just want, I, I showed, uh, let me see, sorry. So this is the uh, water bill. So if you look at the total bill, so that includes everything. That includes uh, the clean water surcharge, that includes um, uh, all of the federal fees that we're required to pay. The increase to a member town is, is a seven, uh, eight point seven percent which is approximately $7.33. Uh, and the uh, non-member towns is 10.71%. Uh, is and then quickly, um, 
the 25 cent is that are you mandated to collect that no or is it saving for kind of a rainy day that no we're we're, we're going to collect it for two years and uh, we're going to have to identify this on uh, the bill specifically identify through public hearings uh, through our website to educate people on what this is uh, and we are expecting that we will put that in a, in a separate fund uh, for anticipation of paying the claims associated with the uh, the lawsuit representing the Conrad Towns. I have to agree. Um, hopefully I come back after this meeting, but I have to agree with uh, Councillor Martino, who isn't coming back, that uh, you know, folks are on a fixed income. Um, you know, young families in town, seniors in town, uh, things are going up. Uh, you know, I hope uh, the commissioners hear me. I hope uh, other member towns are listening as well at some point that um, if we are going to have to approve uh, or you guys are going to have to approve a budget of an 8.7% increase, I think it's probably a little bit too much for, well, you, it's actually 69 for you guys, but an 8.7% right. bill increase for, for residents. Uh, it's going to be a tough uh, pill to swallow no matter how much water they get for it. Okay. Thanks. Are there other council members that have questions? Okay, I, you'll have to come up, come up to the microphone so we can hear you. No, the people on TV can't. There's a handheld mic. We can, we can bring them a mic. And while the mic makes its way over there, I have a, just a couple comments. Um, the lack of support of the integrated plan um, last year was in part a protest vote um, for a few reasons. One was we were upset at the lack of transparency with the entire budget process. Um, we had concerns that we were not able to meet with you and speak with you during the budget process that you weren't able to come to the, to the community and let the residents and council members have that ability to have a conversation with you. And then the third, the third point was that we did feel that last year's increase was exorbitant, especially on the back of several other years with large increases. Um, I do agree with, with uh, Councilor Rell that um, 6.9 on the town side and an additional 8.7 on the residential side is a, is a very big increase for people. Um, and especially there's you know another dollar increase on everybody's bill. Um, that's something that would hurt our lower income residents and it, it doesn't show any real effort on your part to reduce spending. You're just shifting where the money's coming from and removing it from the ad valorem, but you're adding it to the homeowner's water bill. So I do think, um, you know, at, at, on the town side, we've been working very hard to maintain increases, you know, in the 3% or less range. Um, we've held our departments and our board of ed to those kind of guidelines. Um, we've worked hard at working with our uh, unions to make sure that when we are negotiating, we're doing the best we can. Um, our unions are not seeing 3% increases. Our unions, other than police, uh, no longer have pensions. We've moved to HSA programs, high deductible programs, all in an effort to bring spending um, increases to a level that our residents can bear. Um, and I do agree with Tony, uh, Count Deputy Mayor, that um, we are working at increasing our OPEB, but we're doing it um, over a larger span of time so that those increases aren't so much. I mean, we would love to fully fund OPEB in eight years, but it's just not practical to do to our homeowners, our, our taxpayers. So those are all some of the reasons that we did vote no against the integrated plan. And I do agree that um, it will make sense to spread those costs out over a long time, but we still need to see that every year there's fiscal responsibility and that the increases you know every year can't be double digits for both the water portion and the ad valorem so um those are my comments to you that i hope you'll take back and if um, if i may uh yeah. mayor um i didn't even get into the discussions about our our employees so uh to, to be fair i would like to add that uh, in 2015 we took um, more than 100 positions and turn them into 12 positions. So we used to have a hydrant maintainer, gate maintainer, sewer maintainer, re repair maintainer, truck driver. We took all those jobs and turned them into one job. 
that's part of the reason why we were able to, we, we, I would put the MDC against any of our towns in terms of what we have done to cut costs. If the MDC had 700 employees like we did in 2006, the Avalarm increase would be 20%. So it wasn't a mistake that, we, uh, that we've reduced the number of people. We've been working for the last six to seven years to build the structure uh, so that we can reduce. Our anticipation is um, half of our employees are gonna retire in the next five years. So we were planning this for the last six to seven years. We have negotiated, we do have new employees have a uh, high deductible plan. We did negotiate that all new employees, um, their spouses will not be covered by OPEB. That saved the town's $45 million in liability. So that we've done lots uh, to, to I, have, I didn't even get into that tonight, but we have done a tremendous amount to reduce the cost. The challenge that we have in, two th in, in January of 18, we spent a million dollars that was not budgeted because of water main breaks. So as I mentioned, that million dollars probably replaced 100 feet of pipe. Do you wanna spend a million dollars to replace 100 feet of pipe or do you wanna do it proactively and we're going from one mile or one and a half miles to 10 miles because that's what we need to do. Otherwise, you will be spending all of the money which is dictated by emergency, you have no choice, uh, to replace feet of pipe versus miles of pipe. Uh, but we have been extremely fiscal. I don't think the MDC has gotten a fair shake on that. Um, I, I, I would put ourselves against anyone. N no one, no utility. You cannot call a gas company. You cannot call the electric company at two o'clock in the morning and someone show up on your doorstep to find out what's happening in your house. It may not be our issue, but at least someone is there. We have, to, we have no choice uh, to replace this infrastructure. 35% of our budget is a mortgage payment on debt service, 35%. So um, we are now uh, in, in 2006, uh, uh, the, the, the staffing was more than 30 some odd percent of our budget. Now it's in the low 20s, 22%. We've done a tremendous uh, by reducing the cost to our town, and uh, I, uh, I encourage you to look at the facts in our budget. Any other questions, comments? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. Come on up. I just rise quickly to tell you that, right uh, we, uh, for the record, that uh, also attending also attending this meeting tonight, along with our district uh, chairman, is William DeBella here, also. Chris Stone, who is assistant attorney to the MDC, Commissioner Peter Gardo, Commissioner Andy Adel, and uh, what's his name? <laughs> <laughs> thank you, okay, Commissioner thank you. Camilleri. We appreciate that. Okay, thank you for your time this evening. We appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, may I have a motion to take a three-minute uh, recess? So moved. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Motion uh, passes, thank you. This is gonna stay on. Um,
the other. She's doing good. Yeah. Yeah, definitely will. Thank you.
I'm trying to formulate it all, and the guy's looking at me like waiting for the answer or the question. Yeah. We probably had, um, well, be, beside the volunteers, all, all together it was probably 20. Did Paul show up? Paul? Paul did not show up. So I'm going to send him an email. Something but just well, from his organization were there. Because yeah. I talked to the guys here in the morning. He said there's four or five of them. You were there, Mike was there. So I went to one on Belcher first. Nobody was there. But they came later. Yeah, they, they and did then that. I went over to the other one. And that's when I talked to the people, and they said some people had just left there to go over to do the other. Did you meet Frank, the veteran? So did no. Just I didn't. Introduce it. Um, oh, did he come in? Um, November, and then Paul and Karen came out in December. I would probably go with that. <laughs> what was he coming to? I got it. What did he come in? He told me. Um, yeah. He told me what party he was. So. Right. So I had a question about the foundation, moving it from foundation right. to wall, yeah, nice um, concrete walls. Either nice guy. That that's the, both all Republicans. That was a bunch of amendments that was in the original. That was an original. I couldn't ask him. Change to it, right? Right. Yes. Yeah, is this the amendment? Yeah, right. This is just the amendment. This is the amendment. Yes. This would be what we would be in voting on. This. Yeah, right here. Foundation mentioned walls are damaged, collapsing, or crumbling. Let's go. Well, I mean, anything comes up that you've got, you know, foundation walls. It was just originally foundation walls. Now you're looking at crumbling. You know, if there's something that's crumbling, you know, do we know Paul? Is it around? Imagine we're mixed. Mm -hmm. You're mixed.
maybe it should be at a work, workshop instead of a general meeting. Maybe. Three meetings of town managers and mayors. Again, scheduled for three hours. Thank you for the flight of the guy with the big bag on the street. I said if, if we could have gotten him back. Because this could have been two hours. He asked a few more questions. Let's go over. We're just going to withdraw this from the hearing and council action this evening because um, the we, we didn't go in this year. Change it. Yeah. Yeah. It's bad. Good evening. We're back in session. Thank you for your patience. Um, so the next item on our agenda is a hearing to amend Chapter 122 Blight Premises, um, but I'm going to ask that this hearing um, be withdrawn and the council action be withdrawn this evening. The town attorney had some additional um, changes to be made to the ordinance, so uh, we will pass those all on to the next council and have it reintroduced um, at the November, what, 18th meeting, 17th meeting? What is it, Dolores? The 18th. the 18th. So we'll have this reintroduced at the November 18th meeting. So we are not going to have the hearing this evening. Dolores, do we need an official motion for that? Yeah, uh, yes, just withdraw it. Okay. Do I have a motion to withdraw? Move to withdraw A1A ordinance to amend Chapter 122 from Blighted Premises along with its action item B1C1A. Second. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, any council members have questions or comments on it? Councilor Latina. <laughs> Just a quick one. <laughs> it's super important to make sure that we update these and to really follow through on some of the things that residents have been asking about. So should any of you remain on council moving forward, this should be a really good priority to make sure that we all get behind. Thank you, and I agree. Anything else? All right, seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries, and the hearing has been canceled. Next, we will move into general comments. Members of the public may come up and speak. You have five minutes. Please state your name and address and speak clearly into the microphone. Oh, and we have, town manager has a quick comment. Um, similar to the last council meeting, we're having technical difficulties with the timer. So just like the last meeting, I will set the timer for four minutes. When it goes off the first time, that will let you know you have 60 seconds left. Why are we doing that? We have five minutes. Okay. okay. No, that's fine. <laughs> I missed one meeting and I don't know what's going on, Gus. Um, is there anybody who'd like to speak this evening? Okay, come on up, Mr. Colantonio. <clears throat> Good evening, Gus Colantonio, 16 Morrison Avenue. Uh, I know I spoke about this before and I'm gonna speak again. This is uh, my stop sign that I never got. And uh, for those people that were not here in 2009, I'm gonna quote the police report dated May 21st, 2009. Quote, stop signs should not be used for speed control. I agree with that. 
Stop signs should be installed in a manner that minimize the number of vehicles having to stop. Once the decision has been made to install two-way stop control, the decision regarding the appropriate street to stop should be based on engineering judgment. Engineering judgment. In most cases, the street carrying the lowest volume of traffic should be stopped, in most cases. A stop sign should not be installed on the major street unless justified by a traffic engineering study. The very reason that the citizen states we need a stop sign there is the very reason a stop sign should not be added there. End of quote. This is the stop sign that I've been asking. And again, this is a report prepared by uh, the police in 2009. Now let me say that I agree with all the points and I believe that the stop signs at Hillcrest Avenue are not needed, nor required. But the stop sign is needed on Morrison Avenue because of Tifton Road. <clears throat> Intersectional sight distance is not adequate for the average speed on the street. And yet, this is 2019, and I will not go away. I will be coming right here and complain all the time. Just a few facts. Morrison Avenue is 24 feet wide. Hillcrest Avenue is 30 feet wide. Morrison Avenue has a three foot grass strip. Hillcrest Avenue has a 15 foot grass strip. And I'm talking about safety of the road now. Hillcrest Avenue regard and Morrison Avenue, I'm comparing the two. Morrison Avenue has an average daily traffic of 730 cars. Hillcrest Avenue has an average daily traffic of 365 cars. And I do talk with a lot of people that go by and they tell me it's because of the stop sign the additional stop sign that you have on Hillcrest Avenue and you do not have one on Morrison Avenue. The distance between the front of the house is less than 100 feet for Morrison Avenue. That means like, you know, my house versus the house across the street that's less than 100 feet. For Hillcrest Avenue, it's 150 feet. And that distance, I tell you, it makes a big difference. It's much noisier than Hillcrest Avenue. Orchard Street and Tifton Road connect to Morrison Avenue. Only Orchard Street connects to Hillcrest Avenue. But yet, they have three stop signs and we got two. The town has taken measurements. Listen to this now. This is important. The town has taken measurements for the intersectional site distance for Orchard at Hillcrest and found to be 344 feet to the east and 970 feet to the west. Remember those. The town has also taken a measurement for the intersectional side distance for Orchard Street at Morrison Avenue and found to be 290 feet. Tifton Road and Morrison Avenue has a, a distance of 232 feet to the west. 232 feet, 290, so 232 feet is the, the minimum. The minimum. It's, it's, it's a small number. Now let me quote again the police report in 2009. The stop signs for the westbound traffic on Morrison Avenue at Orchard Street is necessary because of a sideline restriction when on Orchard Street. I find that when driving south on Orchard Street, I have another minute, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's difficult to see westbound cars because of a fence. Again, 290 feet distance requires stop sign and 232 feet from Tifton on Morrison Avenue doesn't that require one? Where well, does it make sense? And what about nobody up there? Nobody does anything at all. This is something is wrong. How can you say that 290 feet you require a stop sign and if you have less 232 feet going downhill, you do not require one? What kind of people are representing this town? You wonder why people out there says, you go to the town. Yeah, it's a waste of time. Thank you. Anybody else like to speak this evening? Mr. Mazzarella? <coughs> Good evening, Tom Mazzarella, 600 Walker Hill Road. I had uh, 10 or 15 pages of Blake ordinance stuff to talk about. Oh, sorry. And uh, you threw me off track. 
Maybe you'll be up there in two minute. weeks to talk about it. I get an extra minute. <laughs> Give me a call. Um, Just like that. Light ordinance. Okay. Next thing that I was going to talk about was the uh, purchase of the police cruisers. Four of them. <clears throat> you know how I feel about purchasing vehicles. And for the police cruisers, same as every time we purchase a piece of equipment. Bear with me a second. The vehicles are being removed because they're past their life cycle. Impact if not approved, the aging vehicles would increasingly be not in service due to needed repairs. And the department had comments is the time the vehicles remain off the road for maintenance would continue to grow impacting activities. <clears throat> you know they call Missouri the show me state? Everybody, anybody look that up? It got its nickname because of the devotion of its people to simple common sense. So the phrase literally means, I don't quite believe you. I think I must have been born in the show me state. I would like to see some data that supports the statements that continually are being made regarding vehicle purchase. What is the life cycle of the vehicle? How many miles are on the vehicles that are being replaced? How old are they? Show us the data that supports these statements that the vehicles are not in service due to needed repairs and it's going to continue to get worse. And that the time the vehicles remain off the road is going to continue to increase. I don't believe it. You have to show, to make a, a sound decision, you should be able to evaluate the data. We're never given any, you're never given any data. How do you know this is true? <coughs> because somebody wants to buy four new vehicles every, each and every year to keep the fleet at a like new condition. I don't know. Does, is there a lot of police vehicles that have not been able to respond to calls because they're in the garage being worked on? I don't think so. If that's true, then just tell the public and we'll say, buy 10 new vehicles. But if it's not true, then don't be buying vehicles every time just because there's some rule that says X amount of years we could replace the vehicle. I know they use this soft figure of 10 years for dump trucks. I don't know what it is for police vehicles, but we're not getting the whole story here. Next item, salt. I don't know when it started, but this town used to mix salt with sand and apply it to the roads. Now we use 100% salt, $150,000 worth of salt. You can go drive around during a snowstorm and find piles of it in clumps when the spreaders miss fire or whatever. Mr. Colantonio found a big pile of it last year, I think, down, down by the meadows that actually needed to be shoveled up and hauled away. Why don't we look at going back to the salt sand mix? Less corrosion on the vehicles, less corrosion on concrete, catch basin caps, concrete curbs, not only less damage to our town vehicles, but less damage to the residence vehicles. Salt corrodes. I think somebody should do a little bit of analysis and figure out what's the effect of going with a mix. Buy less salt, more sand, comparable result. Also, this, the amount of salt that we put on the roads creates liquid. The liquid leaks into the cracks that our ceiling hasn't perfectly sealed up and we're thawing out the base underneath the asphalt. And then it freezes, and that exasperates the deterioration of the roads. Keep that base frozen, and you're not going to have those problems, or you're going to have less problems. 
something to consider. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mazzarella. Anybody else this evening want to talk? Mr. Young? Good evening, Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. I hope the citizens tonight took a good look and listened to what Tom Mazzarella had to say. Uh, he is running for town council uh, at, uh, on election day, and I hope people will vote for him. He makes a lot of common sense. I don't see any common sense out of any of the people that are sitting up here. And uh, I hope that the people do something about re replacing you folks. Tonight you had the MDC in here, and I've been reading a little bit about them as far as what they were going to be re talking about, but uh, I, I really think we need new management up there. You know, they've, they've blown through 1.6 million or 1.8, 1.8, 8, 1.8 or 1.6 billion dollars already, and now they're already looking for more on a project that I don't think they were up at that number originally. I think they have a lot of management problems, and I think some of our management is probably our delegation that we have from here in Wethersfield that sit up on that board. I think we should get rid of them as well. So I think you, you know, 8% or whatever, 8 point, whatever, 8.7% increase to the, to the residents, I think is horrendous. But I wouldn't put it past our council to throw us citizens under the bus. You've done it before. Um, Connecticut taxpayers pay some of the highest state taxes and local property taxes in the nation. In this last budget cycle here in Wethersfield, my taxes went up 7% thanks to my town council and my board of education, both who don't understand how to control and, and budget money properly. Connecticut property taxes are driven not only by assessed value placed on our homes, but by the local bonding on which we vote, the majority of which is in the millions of dollars. And there was bonding aplenty throughout Connecticut towns in November 2018, as highlighted in the Hartford Current with the article called Voters Approve Millions of Dollars in, the, in New Projects Across Greater Hartford. The problem with those votes is that the law allows local elected officials to hide pertinent information under the veil of secrecy prior to voters casting their votes on local multi-million dollar projects. This then gives the rise to the legality of the vote. By being denied relevant information to include any and all appraisals contracted for by the town and financed by local property taxes, the voter is denied the right to make an informed decision on, on these projects, which they then will be forced to make, to, to forced to finance if it's approved. And that is exactly what happened here in Wethersfield when myself and other voters were denied access to the taxpayer-financed land appraisal on property the town sought to purchase and which appeared on the November 8, 2018 ballot. The referendum, however, was approved by a margin of votes, of yes votes, of 6,651 against those who voted no, 5,284 votes. And I hope that those 5,284 voters come out and vote for somebody else than who's sitting up here tonight. I also would hope that the 6,651 voters finally realize that they've been snookered badly by this town council and that they come out and do the same thing as that 5,284 people have hopefully will do on election day and vote you out. I subsequently challenged the town before the State Freedom of Information Commission for their refusal to release the town appraisal. Probably five months after submitting my letter to FOI, they heard my case on January 2nd, 2019, following 
already following the November 18th re referendum, pretty late in my, my position. Here too, I was denied the town's financed appraisal as highlighted in their docket, which is eight, the 2018-0602. After the referendum votes were passed and approved by the voters, we learned that the town's appraisal used to negotiate the, the $2.4 million was really only for $1.7 million. And here it is. The people should realize this. You had two appraisals that equaled $1.7 million, and you went in and you paid them 2.4. And, and, and that's a disgrace, and that is a disgrace to the citizens of this town when public officials do such a thing. What do you say, madam? Your five minutes are up, sir. You can come back and Thank speak. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll wait till the, the next, the next uh, opportunity to talk. Very good. Thank you. We move now. Oh, are there any other members of the public who would like to speak this evening? Okay, then we will move into council reports. Uh, council members, do you have any reports this evening? Councilor Latina. Uh, the Wethersfield Advisory Committee for People with Disabilities met this past week. Um, and in addition to the appointment that we will be doing later in the meeting, they have two more vacancies. Um, if folks are interested, should they be contacting Dolores or town manager? What's the process? <laughs> Contact you, Dolores? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other council members? Councilor Lesser. Thank you, Mayor. <coughs> On October 9th, the Veterans Committee met and we discussed a couple of the upcoming events, one, one which was held this past Saturday, October 19th, where the Veterans Commission, in partnership with Johnson Brunetti uh, and uh, Quinnipiac students, uh, cleaned up, fixed up two veterans' homes here in Wethersfield. We have one of our commissioners here, Rick Newell. We have another one here, Dan uh, Camilleri. I want to thank uh, Deputy Mayor Martino for uh, attending and, and, and helping and uh, Councilor Mike well the same. So uh, it was a great event and I know the two veterans that we helped were very appreciative. Uh, secondly and lastly, uh, the Veterans Commission is sponsoring a coffee for veterans this coming Saturday at um, October 19th at the Dunkin' Donuts on 416. I don't know if you can see this, but I can, um, I guess this can put in October the record. 26th. Oh, October 26th, my fault, thanks Mayor. October 26th from 9 to 11, and I can pass this, and we invite all veterans to, to come, and the idea is to, you know, start a conversation with, with our local veterans, see what their needs are, see how we can help uh, as a Veterans Commission. So we look forward to this Saturday, October 26th. Thank you. Thanks. Deputy Mayor? Uh, since our last meeting, uh, there's been a meeting of the Citizen, C Citizen, uh, Senior Citizens Advisory Committee. Uh, at their last meeting, they had a presentation by a new outside group called You Are Community Cares. They gave us a presentation. They're a volunteer group. They match people up with needs to help them to out at no cost. So uh, anybody that has senior that has a need in town, if you contact Chris Taylor, she can team you up with those people to help you as you can. Uh, there's also been a couple meetings of the Veterans Day Ceremony Commission. Uh, the uh, Ceremony that we have every year will be held again this year on Veterans Day, November 11th at 11 o'clock. Uh, it'll be down in front of Town Hall. Inclement weather, it'll be moved into here to the uh, council chambers. Our guest speaker this year will be um, Doug Shipman, uh, who's a retired uh, Army Colonel, uh, who also is the chairman of our Veterans Commission and he will speak, be speaking on you know, what the Veterans Commission can do to help our veterans. Also, since we met, I've been to the, all three of the MDC budget meetings with our town manager. We did have some input and uh, some stuff they listened to, some, some they didn't. Uh, but fortunately, I went from, I have the Laurel from 59 to <coughs> 69, but I still think they can get down to three is my goal. But uh, that's all I have to say on that. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Any other council reports? Do we have any council comments? Deputy Mayor. Uh, I just wanted to say today we had a very nice ribbon cutting uh, at the 
where the Borden is going up right next door. The developer bought the Webster Bank building there, did a nice job on it. They had their grand opening today with a ribbon cutting, uh, gave tours of the facility after it's done wonders for our town. The mayor was there, uh, Councilor uh, Rell and Lesser were there as well, as was uh, our two state reps, uh, Representative Morin and Carrie Woods. And um, I, you know, we got some real nice comments from the developer. He's originally from town and you know wants to do to make our town better and um, did a real nice job and will continue to uh, do more for our community. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, um, I have a few. It was a busy weekend in Old Weathersfield. We had sold out lantern light tours, the well-attended Cove Carnival, and the weekend kind of ended with the Mikey's Place 5K. So I thank all the residents who took part in all of the different events. We're very blessed to have the Keene Fa Foundation and the Diversa family um, that continue to support the community and um, volunteer in our community. Um, and they've both created something very special in town in memory of a loved one. Um, I had the opportunity to speak to some residents at AHEPA this past week, and there are some concerns with transportation there, so I've reached out to the town manager. We're going to do a little looking into that. Uh, residents would like um, some better cross, a, a crosswalk and um, bus shelter there. So um, I appreciated the opportunity to speak with some residents that I don't normally get the opportunity to meet. Um, I, I would echo the deputy mayor's comments. We had a great ribbon cutting at the Borden, and we're lucky to have that development in town. It's a huge, um, a huge investment in our community that's also spurring uh, additional development in that area. 150 apartments, restaurant, um, it's, it's going to bring people in both to live and to visit our community. Coming up, I have a long list. The LEAF program is beginning in November. Please remember to rake leaves to the snow shelf and to not put them in the street. It's a danger to motorists and people riding their bikes. Um, Veterans Coffee, thank you for uh, bringing that up. Councilor Lester, I'm looking forward to stopping in. The Safe Grad is having a clothing drive this weekend on Saturday and Sunday at the middle school. If you have um, things to drop off, they would appreciate that. Our annual photo contest is underway. Photos must be received in the planning department by October 28th, and the winners will appear in the town calendar and annual report. The planning department is currently undertaking an old Weathersfield parking survey. There is a link online on our webpage. If you're interested in being part of that, please, please uh, find that link. It literally takes less than two minutes. It's about six questions. Uh, election day is November 5th, and the polls are open 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. Please get out and vote. November 7th is the Chamber's annual barbecue and beer event. Tickets are available on their website. Uh, the next town council meeting will be Monday, November 11th. So our, our next meeting should be the 4th. That meeting uh, has been canceled. And our next meeting will be Monday, November 11th. And that's the meeting that the new, it's the organizational meeting of council. The new town council will be sworn in. Um, the charter does state that this meeting is held the Monday after the election. And this year it does fall on Veterans Day. Uh, town hall is open. It's a work day in, in town, so we do feel that it's appropriate to have that s ceremony, um, the organizational meeting on Veterans Day. And then last, Therapeutic Rec and Weathersfield Advisory Committee for People with Disabilities will be hosting their Thanksgiving dinner on November 19th um, at 530 in the Community Center. I attended that event last year, um, and I'm looking forward to doing it again this year. And our food bank is in need. So if you're able, canned pasta, rice, um, chicken, peanut butter, tuna, and canned fruit are all um, in high demand. If you have the ability to donate, that's wonderful. Um, moving into town manager reports. Thank you, Mayor. Um, that shortens my list, so that <laughs> makes life easier. Uh, I'll start with last Tuesday, the mayor, Kathy Bagley, Erica Texera from Youth and Family Services, uh, about 15 Weathersfield residents who volunteered as well as myself attended Hartford Foundation for Public Giving's Weathersfield Greater Together Community Kickoff event. Uh, 
We were the host at the Keeney Memorial, so we had the towns of Rocky Hill, Glastonbury, Newington, um, as well as ourselves in attendance, and Weathersfield uh, had the largest turnout, of course. Um, and uh, the purpose of the event, if everyone recalls, there were a number of ad hoc committees that were created. Um, this particular one is to focus on the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving is giving out $100,000 to each of its 29 member towns. And uh, ultimately, uh, the purpose of this meeting was to start to establish a selection committee so that we could then create an advisory committee that would take uh, the town through the process of creating inclusiveness and getting into um, reaching out into to residents who aren't normally part of the process. So more to come on that. They're looking at a multi-month process before we can get the selection advisory committee up and going. But I have received, let's see, uh, close to 30 volunteers just under that particular section of people who are interested in participating. Um, the other ad hoc committee that was announced back in August uh, is to create, uh, a, uh, or the committee for Keisha Farms. Um, as I stated back in August, when we began the application pro process, the purpose of this ad hoc committee will be to retain a consultant that will gather information about town needs and make recommendations for possible reuses of those 35 plus acres. Once the consultant is brought on board, the committee will look to host a series of community visioning sessions so we can get as much feedback from the residents as possible as to, again, what the needs are. Um, and again, the overall goal is, is to really um, make sure that it's not the committee driving the process, but we're taking that information, the consultant is gathering it, making a report to myself as a town manager and then coming in front of the council so that um, you get to hear what the committee is talking about or what the residents are talking about. There were more than 40 applicants originally interested to serve on that. Um, through the process, I thought it was important for me to continue no matter who I spoke to or no matter how many times I published it uh, to talk a little bit about whether or not you get on the committee, ultimately your voice is still going to be heard. The purpose is, again, to bring us through a process and make it uh, as much of an open dialogue as possible. So with that said, uh, I do have a list of seven nam names that uh, I'm putting on this committee that I'll read off. The first is Tara Costan Costanzo, Cynthia Greenblatt, Dan Silbo, Mike Orsini, James Woodworth, Paul Lasella, and Gina Golas. And that's all I wanted to let you know about. Okay. Um, town clerk communication. I have uh, absentee ballots for the election are uh, in the, available now at the uh, my office at the office of the town clerk. Uh, I also have uh, a press release from the police department. Uh, they are having a, a collection of pills that, are, that um, people may not want any more anymore in their house. They're dangerous if dangerous because they're expired, unused, unwanted prescription drugs. You can bring them to the um, police department on 250 Silestine Highway on October 26th, Saturday from 10 to 2. Um, I also know the flu, the flu um, vaccine is going to be given in Rocky Hill tomorrow from two to five at their community room. And uh, I also heard that Walgreens, several different stores that were offering the shots are not doing that anymore. So your last time close by is going to Rocky Hill. And that's it. Thank you. So now we'll move into council action. Um, B1A, acceptance of resignations from boards and commissions. Uh, motion to accept the resignation from uh, the Zoning Board of Appeals from Morris Boria, uh, 100 Goodwood Avenue, 91718 to 63023. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you. Do we have another resignation? Resignation from the Veterans Commission of Karen Opper, 100 Goodwin Park Road, 11-19-18 uh, to 6-30-20, as well as Jocelyn Valente, 55 Old Common, 
from the Weathersfield Advisory Committee for People with Disabilities, uh, term uh, from 9-17-18 to 6-30-20. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Um, next, appointments to boards and commissions. Uh, motion to appoint to the Zoning Board of Appeals for as from an alternate to a full member, John Gustafson, 182 Amherst Street, the period 10-21-19 to 6-30-23, and also on Zoning Board of Appeals to fill an alternate vacancy, Paul Brady, 16 Church Street, 10-21-19 to 6-30-22, and for the Insurance Commission to fill a vacancy, Joanne Roberts, 156 Beverly Road, 10 21 19 to 6 30 20. Second. Um, the insurance committee is 6 30 20. Okay. Um, we have a motion. Thanks. We have a motion in the. What? Sorry? Personnel appeal. On this revised one, I don't have it. Okay. Thank yeah. you. I think we already. Pointed. Yeah, I think she's already. Okay. okay. So we have a motion, and Councilor Lesser, you seconded that? I did. Okay, very good. Any comments or questions? All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. All right, we are not having the, we do not have the ordinance any longer. We will, have, we have no items? We've got one more. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, motion to appoint to the Weathersfield Advisory Committee for People with Disabilities. This is to fill a vacancy. Dan Andrews, 21 Stonegate Road, 102119 to 63020. Second. Thank you. Sorry, I skipped that one. Okay. Um, any comments or questions? Just All a it? correction. Okay. It's proposed by Councillor Latina, not Latino. Oh, autocorrect is a pain in the neck, isn't it? It's tough. It's tough. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Okay, now we'll move past unfinished business into other business, emergency management performance grant. Do I have a, a motion? I move, oh good, Councilor Forrest. Move to approve the grant request for an emergency management performance grant. Do second. we have a second? Okay, Mr. Town Manager. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, this is an annual grant for approximately $13,097, which covers the emergency management director stipend and a portion of the emergency management deputy director's uh, costs. Um, the dollar amount um, uh, does have a match, which we're allowed to do in kind using existing staffing, so there is no cost, direct cost to the town. Okay, very good. Any council questions or comments? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Next, we have the state commitment to fund, LOSIP. Do I have a motion? Uh, yes, motion to accept local transportation capital improvement program, LOSIP funds totaling $2,696,800 from the Connecticut DOT and approve the allocation of $200,000 from the C and CNEF, CNEF Road Improvement Fund to meet matching requirements. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Mr. Town Manager, did you want to begin comments? Or? Sure, I'll, I'll do a quick one for him. Uh, the town's receiving state funding through the uh, through LOSIP, Local Transportation Capital Improvement Fund, um, exactly what was stated by uh, Councilor Breton. Um, and uh, we, are we are required to provide that match, which we're doing through the Road Improvement Fund. So. Derek, uh, Derek Greger is here to fill in any more information or answer any questions. On it. Good evening, Derek. Good evening, thank you. Um, just to give you a little bit of an overview of a uh, refresher on what this was, back in May of 2018, we submitted two applications to the LOTSIP program, which is the Local Transportation and Capital Improvement Program that is administered by CROG, it's state funding. Um, both projects had gotten selected, this was the first one. Um, with this program, 100% of construction cost is funded through the program. The town's match is uh, survey and design costs uh, for the project. This particular one, it's Walker Hill Road. It's running north from Jordan Lane to Victoria Road in Hartford. Um, this is an arterial road. S serves the Department of Labor, Department of Corrections. Um, 
basically we're looking at full road reconstruction out there. Uh, we have a concrete road base that is failing, which is causing a lot of the issues everyone's very aware of on that stretch of road. We're gonna take the road base out, um, put back a typical road section. There's complete streets elements to the plan that includes bike, uh, bicycle lanes, um, pedestrian improvements, um, new ramps, refuges, refuges at the crosswalks um, as you get across the road. Um, the islands in the middle will remain, grass, um, the whole project will have granite curb installed um, from Jordan Lane North into Hartford, um, which would be more durable for plowing and just have a nice look for this gateway to and from town. And uh, we had also worked with uh, CT Transit. We're going to have some pull-off areas for the buses so they can get off the road better, um, as well as some uh, concrete pads and sidewalks. So uh, at this point, DOT has issued a commitment to fund letter to the town saying that they're committed to funding uh, the project. Um, essentially, the scope uh, and the associated cost of the program of the project is so large, it was, it's something we will not be able to do as part of our annual paving programs because it's probably two years worth of paving for us to do this one stretch of road. So this is a good opportunity for the town to get state funds to, to get a nice project like this done. Um, just given our limited staff availability, we, we just don't have the time to put in this level of effort you need for a design of a project of this size. So our request is to um, use $200,000 of the road funds as the town match for survey and design work on the project. Um, it's an investment for the 2.6 million or so that we're gonna get in state funds to do the work. At this time, we're expecting um, if this gets approved, uh, try and do design through 2019 and plan for construction in 2020. Very good, thank you. Are there any council questions or comments? Councilor Latina. Hi, Derek. I'm wondering, does that design work include this southern section on your map? There's that four-way intersection underneath the overpass. That's really confusing. Is that going to get fixed in this project? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it like a facial reaction. <laughs> uh, that is not part of the project as it stands. That is a D uh, DOT intersection um, being Jordan Lane comes through there. So. That's something we can discuss if there's some minor improvements we might be able to make, but generally the overall construction really started at the north side of the intersection and went north. And part of that is because um, we're looking for you know, lo lo lots of funds as municipal funds and to try not involve the state at the time we were going in for the application would have just been too cumbersome and time consuming to get their approval on some changes. So if there's some minor changes we can make, I agree they're, they're needed. Um, it's, that would be a good opportunity for us to talk to them about if there's a way we can work that into the program within the existing allocation of funds. Um, but it's not specifically part of it uh, as it stands right now. Might they be interested because they have some major buildings right there that their employees have to get in and out of? You would think so. <laughs> <laughs> can we help in that effort? <laughs> Yeah, I think it would be worthwhile to have that discussion with them while we're out there doing work. Mm -hmm. They had, as you're probably aware, they had recently reconstructed the intersection not too long ago um, and didn't really address some of those issues that still exist. So, like I said, maybe there's some minor opportunity to change some curb lines, some striping, um, something to help you know better define uh, traffic going through the intersection. So, Thank you. Anything else? Deputy Mayor? Just a quick uh, question, Derek. Uh, once the project starts, uh, how long before you think it will be finished? Uh, it depends on when we start. I mean, I'd be hoping for a spring of 2020 uh, start, so we'd be finished up late summer, early fall um, would be my expectation. Um, depends how quickly the design process goes, because that does have to go through CROG reviews. So there's preliminary submittals. They make comments. So depending on how quickly it goes, if it starts later in the season, it might be something we finish up in spring of 2021, but I, I would hope to have it done before then. Okay. Have residents and business owners in that neighborhood been notified about the possibility of this project? I don't, we've spoken to some of the businesses that we were affecting driveway aprons, uh, such as uh, the northwest corner, the garage there. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been in touch with the state who owns the properties on the east side. As far as the individual residents, we haven't um, touched base with them, but at this point we will uh, contact them. Uh, we'll, I'm sure we'll hold, hold some public information meetings to discuss what the project will be and solicit some input. At this point, it's all conceptual design, um, so we'll be fine-tuning some of what we've laid out and uh, going forward. Sure, because I think there's an apartment building there as well as the, yes. yeah. So yeah. You're, you've got a density there that'll need to be addressed, having that road kind of in process for six months. 
Yeah, fortunately, it's, you know, with the two northbound and southbound separated lanes, I think we're going to have the opportunity to work on yep. one side and direct traffic for the other. So, yes, it would definitely be an inconvenience, but uh, at least we do have some road width there to work with. Good. Good to hear. Anything else? Okay. Seeing nothing. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have a bid purchase of four police interceptor SUVs. Do I have a motion? Nobody wants I'll, to make a motion. A motion to purchase four <laughs> 2020 Ford police interceptor SUVs for the police department to remove four police vehicles that are past their life cycle using CNEF reserve funds. Do, do I have a second? Okay, good. We have a motion and a second. Mr. Town Manager, did you want to begin? If I may, Mayor, okay. and to the Council. Uh, as approved in the fiscal year 1920 budget, the Town is purchasing four new police vehicles to replace aged and damaged interceptors. Uh, these items were initially presumed to be funded through lease financing when we did the budget. However, I'm recommending to use uh, CNF, CNEF reserve funds as there are long-term costs associated with leasing versus a purchase. And what we're attempting to do is not to continue to add to our debt and, um, and pay it versus financing it. Thank you. Welcome, Chief. Do you have anything to add? I'll allow the Chief to elaborate. Yes, do you have something to add um, before we ask questions? Sure, uh, thank you. Good evening. Um, we are in dire need of these four vehicles to say the least, uh, the four vehicles that they'll be replacing are, these are all line cars. Um, car 48, an interceptor has 103,000 miles on it. Car 13, a Ford SUV has 118,000 miles on it. And the powertrain transmission has problems with the powertrain and transmission. Uh, car six, a 2000 Ford sedan interceptor has current mileage of 89,000 miles but it had uh, had an electrical fire in the car which caused significant damage to the floor and carpet wires melted together and they had to be re-spliced they were bundled into a large plastic sle sleeve that sits on top of the carpeting in the car and the, th and the fourth one is car 11 2014 suv interceptor current mileage is 100,000 but the vehicle had been involved in three separate accidents, two of which caused substantial damage, resulting in uh, $20,000 in repairs. The vehicle has a problem with a loss of power during acceleration, and the interior carpet and seats are deteriorating. Um, we need those cars. Uh, the council had approved way back when uh, five and four. We've never gotten five. It's always been four. We're able to make do with the four, but we need the four. And the, the other thing too, I know we always use mileage as a, as a comparative, but it's, it's really not the mileage, it's the hours that the cars are running, the idle time, because the cars are running 24 hours a day, the line cars. And um, we're down to the last Crown Vic, which was last manufactured in 2012. We're finally getting rid of, I think we still have one that we're still using, but it's for a, a, an SRO who's very tall and can't get into those interceptors. <laughs> Any council members, Deputy Mayor? Uh, just one question, Chief. Uh, looking at the spreadsheet on the prices, uh, Three of them at one price, and one of them is 500 and some dollars more. I just wondered why the differential in price on one vehicle over the other three? That's because one of them is mine. What are you adding to yours that they don't have? Carpeting. Uh, I hate those rubber mats, so I ask for carpeting. Okay. So can you just, so when the, the just to 
clarify and let people in the audience know the four cars come in they go into the administrative and the detective division first. detective division first for a year and then they're put on actually two years okay they go in there for two years um, when they go into patrol they they have relatively low mileage um, and that gets us that extra two years because when it goes into patrol again they're running 24 hours a day the more susceptible to accidents and damage um, at least we've got the first two years out of the car before we lose any and we periodically lose a car for, for many different reasons so um, that's it's worked out very well for us that type of rotation so how many years does it take to replace the fleet how long does a car stay in service well as you said I, we still have because you said 2012 yeah we have we have two crown vicks left uh, so that's eight years mm -hmm. almost um they we so how many cruisers we, we rotate do them through first they they go through the administration and uh detective division how many cars do they have how many do you have all together then do you have 30 Tw no 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 well, i'm doing four times eight is no we don't have that many okay. cars we have uh i think it's 23 or 24 so if we replace four every year, then every six years, your fleet should be, well, in theory, it's, replaced? It's, it's not the, yeah, again, it's not the entire <laughs> fleet, because what, what we do with the cars after they go through patrol, mm -hmm. we keep them a couple for traffic. We keep, a, we have the, the SROs with the cars that are parked at the schools. Yep. We have uh, a DARE officers using them. We have a training officer that has a car to, so we can send people to outside trainings mm -hmm. um, so there's other cars in the fleet the cars that I'm that we're concerned about are obviously the line cars the sure. cars that are out there every day 24 hours a day mm -hmm. when when the cars that aren't are still in good shape is what we rotate now through all those different different other positions so you and will be taking four off the line with the yes. with the purchase of these four though yes yes but some years that doesn't happen some years you only remove two or three no uh, we, every year we take we we get four in we take four out but you don't get rid of them you may no. repurpose them yes but this year are you getting rid of the four or are you repurposing no getting they're getting rid of? yeah no they're they're shot okay any other questions or comments <laughs> Councilor latina um just a quick comment i i'm not so certain that i necessarily agree with the rotation policy that you have in place uh, if the line cars are being utilized that often, shouldn't these then go to the line? Uh, it just... I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, I'm not so sure that the management need the new cars. I think it might be the, the folks that are out there doing the day-to-day -day activity. Well, when, they, when the administrative, administrative cars go out to the line, they're only two years old and they have very low mileage on them. You know, usually between 10 and 12,000, maybe 15,000 miles. So the cars are still pretty new and good shape. Uh, that's when patrol gets them. But that's when we have the most use out of them. If you did want it through patrol first, if you put the brand new cars into patrol, we'd only get two, maybe three years out of it. This way, we're getting almost five years out of a car before it goes through the rest of the uh, department and then released. I still I, I respectfully have, disagree. I have the, we did a study on this not too long ago, several years ago. I'll give you the results of that study. That study shows that our rotation is really the best for us. But, and I'll be glad to give it to you. But the other comment I wanted to make is I graduated the police academy in 1974. I wrote a paper in my academy class talking about the intersection of Jordan Lane and Wilkett Hill <laughs> and how it needed to be corrected. <laughs> and as you can see, 45 years later, it's still the same. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments or questions? Councilor Forrest. Thanks, Mayor. Just briefly, Chief, and you and I have talked about this before, but um, I'd really like to, uh, for the police department to consider the use of electric vehicles in its fleet. Um, the discussions that you're having right now about ma about maintenance, breaking down of transmissions, engines, and you joke, not joke, but seriously talk about 115,000 miles. The, uh, the technology is there to have these engines run 
millions, million and millions of miles. Um, and we wouldn't be talking, the replacement cycles that you go through are not just, they're elongated just tremendously. So even if the car is cost or the vehicle costs 20, 30, 40% more, the amount that you get out of it from maintenance or lack of maintenance and durability is tremendous. In addition, the fuel's at least half, if not more, uh, in order to run the vehicle. So, if, and there are police departments that are moving in this direction. Uh, and so, if, <coughs> as we move in to the future, or as we move into just next year, we could start to see what those numbers would look like and maybe talk to some police departments here, Canada, Europe, that have started to introduce these types of vehicles um, into their fleet. I think you'll see a lot less, um, well, the, the data is showing that there's just a lot less hassle, a lot less maintenance. And I know there's a lot of suit out to a police car, but those th problems are being solved today. And uh, I think it should be taken into consideration as we look at our whole fleet. I would consider anything, especially now that Harley Davidson is making an electric motorcycle. They are. They have made. They have made. I know. Yeah. They took it off the line, though. But I understand it's coming back. Yeah. Live wire, it's called. Yeah. Uh, listen, I'm not adverse to anything new and innovative. Uh, the only thing is that the problem with the electric cars today is that they need to be recharged. And if you're in the middle of something and responding to a call, you don't want to run out of juice. Um, when these things are perfected and when they're better, I'll be the first one here to asking for the additional money to buy something like that, at least to try it out. I don't know of any Connecticut Police Department that has an electric cruisers yet. I think it's fine. It's okay to lead though, Chief. It's okay. Okay. <laughs> hey, you want to spend 40% more on a car? Well, we save in it, I think, in a lot of other areas. But Not if it gets crashed. Um, <laughs> okay, any other comments or questions? Oh, Councilor Rell. Just for clarification, I thought I heard Mayor Bello say that, or question, the vehicles that these are replacing will be taken off the line. Yeah, they'll go to auction. But if you're get, are you getting a new police SUV? Yes. And will that go down in rotation, or yes. will that yeah. be taken? Okay, so off the line is off, not auctioned off. That will get the four that I down. mentioned will be auctioned off. Excuse me? The four that I mentioned will be auctioned off. Okay. Because they're they're done. They're, they can't be used anymore. But management or? Um, management, the cars in, in the administrative division and the detective division will filter down into the patrol division. Yep. And then from the patrol division, they'll go down into the cars that are workable. will go down into that lower level where the SROs, mm -hmm. the DARE officer, mm -hmm. um, the training, and all those other places that the, the cars are being used and still can be used. When they're done there, they Stay also off. get auctioned off. Gotcha. If there's any value left to them. We really use the cars until they're pretty well done. And then does Sally and her team disassemble lights, reusable lights, electronics? Mo most of the, the equipment that are on the cars stay with the cars until the end, and then uh, I don't, I'm not even sure what they do with them, but I don't think they reuse them. In other words, it wouldn't go on to a brand new car. Right, okay. W w please come up to the microphone, Sally, thank you. As the fleet has moved to standardize to the Explorer, the equipment that is used on the Explorer um, can be used in another model Explorer. It, um, when we had the mixed fleet with Crown Vic, some of the interceptors and Explorers, the size differential caused us not to be able to um, just do a one-for-one -one like if equipment was coming off of a car. But now that we are cycling through to where the fleet is consistent, we can, when we, when possible, reuse light bars or other equipment from a car that's coming offline onto a newer vehicle because it is the same model. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, our next item is rock salt. Motion to award the rock salt bill to DRVN for $62.50 a ton and to Eastern Salt for $59.39 a ton. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Mr. Town Manager, do you want to begin? Uh, yes, I do. Thank you, Mayor, and to the Council. The Town annually bids this product to ensure that there is an adequate supply on hand uh, to keep roads safe and passable during the storms. Uh, the cost associated with this was approved as part of the fiscal year 1920 budget, and I have Sally Katz already up at the microphone to answer any questions that you may have and tell the tale of woe and what happens when we don't, um, we don't use these types of bids. Uh, with this bid, what we have found over the years is that by going out and doing our own bid process for SALT, it gives us the opportunity to get the product from multiple vendors. Um, if you may recall a few years ago, people who were utilizing the state bid contract when we had a pretty horrific uh, winter season and the SALT was in limited supply, the state cut off the opportunity for the uh, towns and cities who had gone off the state contract to get the salt, um, the state basically took it first and then uh, made the allotments to the towns and, and cities. So we have found over the years that we can get very competitive pricing if we go out on our own. Uh, it allows us by having two vendors not to have um, a delay in a salt delivery when needed. Um, and so again, this is, is what we put through. Uh, we do keep a consistent budget number, hopefully in a um, calm winter season. Uh, we would hope to be able to give money back. Um, for example, last season, while it was not a heavy snow season, it was a, quote, normal season, we did have a lot of icing events, which caused us to use the salt because of the fact that um, as you may know, salt uh, lowers the freezing point of water. We had some very small um, icing incidents, but there was enough of a glaze on the roads where we needed to go out and salt, although we were not um, plowing as much because of the events were of a different nature than uh, an 11 or 12 inch snowstorm. Okay, um, have, have we used these bidders in the past? Yes. Yes. And how does this price compare to last year's prices? Uh, it is exactly the same for DRVN, and it is 21 cents lower for Eastern Salt. Okay. Council, Councilor Latina. You guys are going to miss me. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to find out. I thought Tom brought up a good point earlier. What is the difference between okay. the salt sand mixture and then the brine? Why right. do we use one over the other? Okay. First of, first of all, the brine mixture, which you see the state use, is a lot more expensive. Mm -hmm. And you have to be able to have a place to have the holding tanks for the brine. You need to be able to mix the brine. Uh, and you need to be able to outfit your trucks to be able to do the brine, and then they still salt or use a, a different material. It's an expensive process. It does work. There is a lot of pre-treating that you have to do, and it just is not, for a municipality of our size, it's not really as um, cost-effective as other means and methods. Um, sand is only, is only appropriate and only effective on the surface as it touches the ice. As plowing takes place or as snow continues to fall, the sand is not effective. And so the salt will, because the salt will continue to melt the surface of the ice and the snow, whatever it is mixed with. Um, there's also been a lot of problems with sand in that you get sand collecting in drains, in drainage areas, um, you're doing a lot more cleanup in the spring, so you're spending money on a lot more of the street sweeping, the drain cleaning, the basin cleanings. Um, what we're trying to move toward, um, even on a statewide level, is more electronic salting or salt um, distribution so that you can use a much lower amount of salt. Yes, there are times when a salter clogs or there is a malfunction and you get a larger amount in a certain area. Um, that it's, that's what happens. I mean, it's not foolproof. 
However, we do try to use least amount possible um, and also providing a good um, area. We also respond to when the police call us and tell us we need to salt intersections and other things. We may have gone over it once or twice and we still may get calls that people are sliding. So we may need to go out and put product in again. Um, all of our neighbor towns, we are no one is using sand anymore. It isn't an inexpensive thing to do. It does clog the drains and it does not give the melting that the salt does. At some point, might we, might we be <coughs> able to do our own brine? Is that something in the future? No, I mean, it's a, chemi it's a chemical brine. Um, right now, any of the organics that are out there are extremely expensive. Mm -hmm. Some of the beet juice derivatives, cane derivatives, even some of the um, grass and other clippings derivatives that are, they're using up north are very, very expensive and not proven in this particular type of climate yet. Any other comments? Okay, seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. <clears throat> okay, no ordinances, resolutions, or appointments for introduction. We have a motion to approve meeting minutes of September 16th. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Are there any changes, corrections? to these minutes? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Um, next we have the approval of the meeting minutes of October 7th. Do I have a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Any changes to these minutes? Corrections? Okay, seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any, um, any abstentions besides me? I was not there. Okay, all in, <laughs> motion carries. Gosh, it's getting late. <laughs> um, we'll move into public comment. Members of the public have five minutes to speak. Please state your name and address and speak into the microphone. Mr. Colantonio. Good evening again. Gus Colantonio, 16 Morrison Avenue. I just have a question for uh, the chief of police, but he's no longer there. If we were buying and paying for that car that he's getting, would he have chosen the carpet or the other way if he had to pay it himself? Or let's say that he wanted uh, silver plated something inside the car. Who will pay for that? This, this is ridiculous. They can have anything they want for two years, new car all the time. And I have to say that basically the way things are going in, in Wethersfield, I, you know, I try to get out of Morrison Avenue and everybody's speeding on, on, on Silas Dean. I go at 25 miles per hour, that's the posted speed. <laughs> and people beep on me all the time. What's going on? This is in front of the, of the police station. You know, and I'm gonna say that a lot of people on, uh, on Morrison Avenue with that stop sign, I've seen a lot of them, they don't stop. I'm gonna say it publicly because they have accused me before that I've called the police because people don't stop. No, I never called the police, but I'm gonna say that people don't stop and nothing is getting done. Going back again now, because I don't think you guys understand what it means. The regulations call for, you know, Morrison Avenue, the posted speed on Morrison Avenue is 25 miles per hour at the very beginning of next to Worker Hill. And the intersectional side distance required for 25 miles per hour is 280 feet. The intersectional side distance when it comes from Tifton, it's only 232 feet as measured by the town. And the grade, that's just if, if it's a flat area. The grade downhill is 6%, which means that it doesn't meet the requirements. How many times I've said it, and how many times more I'm gonna say it, and yet nobody moves to do anything. 
Now, again, in 2009, the police report, quote, the stop sign for Westbound traffic on Morrison Avenue at Orchard Street is necessary, is necessary because of a sideline restriction when on Orchard Street. I find that when driving south on Orchard Street, it is difficult to see Westbound cars because of a fence at 6 Orchard Street and the grade of the road on Morrison Avenue just west of Orchard Street, end quote. What is he saying? Anybody has read this and questioned yourself? What does it mean that the police report is saying you can only see 290 feet? That's why you need a stop sign in the westbound direction. And I'm saying expand your horizon. I just go down a little bit. The intersectional side distance from Tifton is 232 feet, and it's downhill. So the report says you need a stop sign for 290 feet intersectional side distance. Wouldn't you need one for 232 feet? To me, it's, it's, it's simple. They've been skidding around here and there. You don't need this. You don't need that. We need permission from the, the state. This and they are all excuses. And again, you go all over Weathersfield, you see stop signs all over the place. And the only reason I really add, says there are too many stop signs in town we're not gonna install anymore. I'm not gonna go away, guys. You know, and I hope the voters see what's going on. 10 years, the report, it's May 21st, 2009. It's over 10 years, nothing is getting done yet. And yet, a lot of students cross Morrison Avenue every morning to attend, I got another minute, right? Yes. To, to attend. Active or we are reactive. The chart says that doesn't meet the requirements for 25 miles per hour on the street. And yet, you don't do anything at all. Thanks. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak tonight? Mr. Mazzarello. Tom Mazzarello, 600 Walker Hill Road. A couple of things just that got discussed tonight. The intersection at Jordan Lane. I was at a meeting where there was the <coughs> DOT people there. They refer to that intersection as the Genghis Khan intersection. It has a name. Whoever gets there first goes. Yeah, it's, crazy. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. And they said at that meeting there is nothing to be done because of the geography of the bridge uh, supports and so on. There's nothing they can do. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't hold my breath for that one. Police cruisers. I heard what the chief had to say. It makes a lot of sense, but the bottom line is the upper management gets a new car all the time. They always get new cars. Some of them evidently have carpeting. I mean, I can't even believe he said that. <laughs> you know, he should have made up something else. <laughs> but I don't see that. The, the best vehicle should be put in the most important place, the line, as he refers to it as the line vehicles, the guys that are out doing the job. Uh, I, I just don't, I don't agree with that. Uh, I wanted to clarify the road salt. What I was, I wasn't talking about Brian, I was talking about a mixture of sand and salt is what the town of Wethersfield used to use with, I think with good results. Well, as far as I know, we still sweep the roads, even though we use salt, we still sweep the roads. You know, they came by my house. Somebody did. I don't think they would do it for free, but um, yeah, they maybe just <laughs> did my house. And uh, we vacuum out the catch basins, even though we're not using sand. So I'd like you to revisit that for next season. Uh, MDC, another mind-boggling presentation. 
What a waste of time. Come on. That was an absolute waste of, of an hour of oh, everybody st sitting oh, here. Agree. Seemed like six hours. Well, you couldn't follow that. I mean, he couldn't even get the percentage right on the pipe. It was 1,500 feet, and he kept saying uh, 150 feet was 1%. What is he talking about? Uh, and I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be like Gus with the stop sign. I'm not gonna go away. How can they defend this ad valerum? It makes absolutely no sense that it costs me more to flush my toilet than someone in Hartford. That doesn't make any sense. And to be honest, I think the real reason is they don't have any real idea of how to separate the cost between the water and the sewage. They don't know. If you look at the line items in the budget, it's like 45% for sewage and 55% for water or whatever it is, and they apply that percentage to everything. How can they say that a dump truck is used 55% of the time on a sewage job and 45% of the time on water. It does, doesn't make any sense. I don't think they really know. And they're terrified of, of looking into the ad valerum, elimination of the ad valerum. He had it on his chart, but he didn't discuss it. I don't know if you caught that. He, he switched over to uh, Rocky Hill wanting to eliminate MDC completely. Yeah, that's going to be more costly. I don't see why, as a town council, we can't put more pressure on MDC. I, we have three voters out of 21. A few, uh, a few years back, I was, I guess, on a short list, you would call it, for being on the MDC commission. And I looked at the meetings. I read a bunch of the minutes of the meetings. It's a joke. They go there, boom, 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 21 people, yes, yes, yes. The meeting's over. There's no discussion. There's no nothing. It's a complete joke. Okay. Uh, I just want to say uh, thanks to the council for putting up with me. Um, and thank you all for your time. Thankless job. I've uh, recently knocked on a lot of doors. And a lot of people have asked me, what are you, stupid? Why would you <laughs> want to be on the town council? Uh, uh, people are going to scream at you. Uh, it's a thankless job, but I appreciate everybody doing uh, doing your best. I didn't agree with some of you sometimes, all the time, whatever. But anyways, thank you. Thanks, Tom. Mr. Young? Good evening again, Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road, and I'll pick up where I left off. After the referendum votes were passed and approved by the voters, we learned that the town's appraisal used to negotiate the ballot amount of $2.4 million was actually $1.7 million. As of this date, the farm has been sold, and the town and the, and the taxpayers borrowed money has been expended. Yet it wasn't until September 10th, 2019, 11 months after the referendum, I was provided three separate appraisals of the Keisha farm and an invoice to support the $3,200 appraisal fee commissioned by the town of Wethersfield for the property. So what happened here? The town went into negotiations with a supporting recommendation from the town's appraiser for $1,763,000 and ended up agreeing to $2.4 million without providing any supporting professional real estate analysis for the additional $700,000. I don't know if we'll ever hear the supporting documentation or see it that represents the $700,000. Now. Gary keeps poking his head up. Gary did send out three, and I mentioned, three appraisals. Two of them said, effective date, April 20th, 2018. And this was for Jeff Bridges, town manager. The third one that I get, 
says effective date April 9th, 2019. April 9th, 2019 is approximately six months after the referendum that this was produced. In order to come up with some phony number that Mr. Manager wants to push on to the, to the folks of Wethersfield. Because, but yet your total is still under your $2.4 million. You haven't supported it. Yet you gave me a bogus information. April 9th, 2019, six months after the referendum. I think the citizens of Wethersfield should realize that this is how you folks operate. You pull some fast ones. You pushed something through very quickly. You didn't know what you were doing. You went in gun ho and paid a horrendous amount of money for something that was not worth anything near the amount that we paid. Now, if we go back to the, the um, public hearing dated September 4th, 2018, and I've quoted this more than once, Mr. Forrest said, the price is probably market price for the land. How could he make a statement with like that when he only had appraisals valued at $1.7 million for something that, was, that he agreed to $2.4 million? How could he possibly do this? He jeopardized the entire town council. You're all, you're all to blame because not one of you had have denounced him that his number was, that his statement was wrong. You're all in it, Republicans and Democrats, because you wanted something so badly and the value wasn't there and you kept the public out. You didn't release your appraisal. What if you released that appraisal for $1.7 million before the referendum, a month before? What would have happened to your vote? You wouldn't have gotten your 6,600 and whatever that number was. You, it would have gone a lot lower, a heck of a lot lower than, than, it, than it even should be. Well, and one then, more minute. Yeah, one more minute. And then people should realize that the subject property, that they, one of the subject properties used in your appraisal was a property on Back Lane. It was 15.8 acres of land for $640,000. In this report, it says it has the ability or the yield of 40 building lots. Consider that, 40 building lots, it says, and they paid $640,000. I didn't calculate it, so I don't know what the number is. But the fact remains, Keisha Farm was only, you were talking, there was only 32 or 33 building lots. The yield was a heck of a lot less than this property on Back Lane that only sold for $640,000. So if you double that $640,000, you're at $1.2 million for 30 acres. And, and you people really took the bait. The bait, and you, and you hammered the heck out of the whole, the whole town. 5,200, 5,500 people should not vote for any one of you. Yes, I'll wrap it up, madam. And, and, and none of you should get reelected. Thank you very much. So now we move into executive session. Do we have a motion to move into executive motion session? Motion to move into executive session. Do we have a second? Second. All, um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. <laughs> we did. Does anybody need a two-minute break before we head in?